Uh, yeah, that was my four years of college. Oh, I'm sorry. Castellonia's freshman year. Greg Robinson was the next three. Um, yeah, it was really bad. So, wait, so which year did you graduate? 2008. It was a really bad time for Syracuse sports, but that was when it was basketball. They just won the championship. Right. Before I got there. And then they kind of graduated everyone. It was McNamara. Oh, it was because McNamara was still Yeah, yeah he was kind of pulling the team along, but it was, it was adequate at best. Yeah, yeah, we're back on. Um, but so wait a minute, you were so what it was oh five was what we refer to as the Diamond Ferry game, which was fucking there. I was right. Me too. Was, I was also there. I was wearing a sombrero in the parking lot beforehand because we were going to go to the Fiesta Bowl. I mean, Diamond Ferry is a legend. I, I mean, probably still because Syracuse football really hasn't had a better moment. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that was that was a pretty legendary performance by him. That was uh, highly disappointing. Uh, so. So uh, you would have been. Um, my sister-in-law was at Syracuse at the same time, but she was. Uh, you were. You were in communications, or so she would. I think she majored in everything but. You know, she like had a triple. What's up? You don't happen to have. Um, you have a presenter thing. So is it your office or is it? Yeah. Do you want me to go get it? Actually. I thought there was a chance there because it presumably has a laser pointer. That's all I wanted. Is that a laser pointer? Yeah, it does. Professor of Mathematics and Professor of Statistics at St. Lawrence University. He co-founded Statistical Sports Consulting, LLC, with uh, the 2012 NCAA Division, NCAA Division I um, Hockey Coach of the Year, Chris Wells. So he's consulted in hockey, football, and baseball, and is a four-time finalist for research paper competition at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytic Conference. He'll be talking about the values of the zone type. Thanks, Matt, um, and uh, thanks, Ryan, um, for inviting me. Um, I, as someone who's helped organize uh, one or two of these things, uh, I, I certainly appreciate all the work uh, that you guys do. So uh, before we forget, can we give these guys a round of applause? Specifically for organizing. Uh, I was gonna start by saying how much I, I appreciated the fact that 
these guys had scheduled me at roughly halftime of the, the Penn State pit football game, and I'm a Penn State alum, I appreciate that, but given that the last time I looked it was 28-7 pit, I don't think I want to sit back down, actually. Um, we are. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm going to be talking about Value of a Zone Start. Um, the, some of the folks, so these are former students of mine that contributed, and then also Chris Wells, who's my longtime um, partner in, uh, in crime in terms of doing hockey. Um, just, to, I guess I'll note a couple of things. Matt Generous uh, did an honors thesis at St. Lawrence and is still, I believe, under contract in Finland. Uh, in the Liga, um, and Jay Curlbutt graduated about a year ago and uh, just got a job with an NHL team, so um, that's, uh, that's a very cool thing. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to throw out a definition of a zone start. I think probably everybody in here knows what that is, so I won't have to do too much of that. Um, what I want to do here is try to get an assessment and try to quantify um, what is the average impact. Um, there may be a different impact per player, but we're going to try and get an average impact uh, across players in the NHL. Uh, and we're going to assume some symmetry. So we're going to assume that moving from the neutral to the offensive zone is going to be the same as the negative of moving from the neutral to the defensive zone. Um, so uh, a, a little bit of motivation, and unlike uh, Matt Cain, I did actually randomly pick two players, <laughs> um, somewhat randomly. Um, so, so uh, start with David Backus, who started 25% of his shifts in 15-16 uh, in the offensive zone and about 41% of the defensive zone. Uh, and Bobby Ryan from Ottawa, which is uh, about an hour and a half from uh, St. Lawrence. Um, he got about 40% of his starts in the offensive zone. I mean just when guys come over the boards, but I'm going to, and I will be specific later on because I've got math and notation. Um, I, I know, yes, Micah sits up straight for that one. Um, I am going to take all of the events that happen in the subsequent time that they're on the ice. So what I mean is a shift where you started outside of your offensive zone. Um, so uh, we have this information, we have this context. We've got, I've got a couple of outcomes, uh, points here, and then I've got Corsi Rail up here. And the question is, how do, how do we deal with that and how do we adjust? Uh, and we want to take into account that context. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up a, a mathematical model. We're going we're gonna to look, actually, a statistical model. Uh, and we're going to look at try and assessing that impact across a couple of different, a couple of different outcomes. Um, a, a little bit of history, uh, I think Vic Ferrari begins this work as he begins so many things. Um, and then there was some work by, by Fenwick and, and, and Tori Purdy um, and, and Dirk Hogue, just a name I haven't heard in a while, uh, but it was nice to see uh, when I looked some of this stuff up that Dirk had done some work here. Um, uh, Jared L, uh, I think from uh, Broad Street Hockey and David Johnson had done some work. Eric Tolsky does a nice summary in about 2012 of some of this. There's been a whole bunch of attempts since then, uh, and basically it's motivated by, it seems to, to come up every once in a while, um, the, the debates about whether there is some value here. Um, and so when, when, uh, when Matt and Brian put out their call for abstracts, there seemed to be some discussion. I thought I could add a little bit to this discussion with what I'm going to talk about, talk about next. Um, so the, the, the crux, we know that there are all of these effects that have an impact when a player is on the ice, right? So we know the players that they're playing with, the players that they're playing against, score effects, rank effects, home ice, etc. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically and only here about, um, about even strength, um, but uh, if you want to talk about special teams and add that in, uh, we get a bit more, a bit, actually a good bit more complicated. Um, I'm going to take an approach that is basically a, a multiple regression to events or to shifts. Um, this is actually work that, that's been around for a while, this basic approach. Um, 
you know, and, and some big names here, Brian McDonald, uh, Gramercy Taddy and Jensen, that's a very uh, heavy, heavy math paper. There, instructors and, and Jim Kiro, my student, um, and then Andrew and Sam, and there are a couple of their collaborators here. Uh, and, and the idea here is that we're gonna look at all of these models, either look at shift level data or they look at event level data. And that is what we're recording is the impacts uh, of all of those factors with each shift. So we're not looking at game totals. Um, one of the things we know in statistics is that the, where the impacts are occurring is how we should have our data. Or otherwise we're gonna end up missing some factors and missing some effects uh, because we're not granular enough and then you're ending up averaging across things and that can be problematic. Um, and I know that this, I know there's some basketball people in the room. Uh, this work actually starts with, uh, with basketball uh, and if you're searching in the statistics literature, because I know that's what you're all gonna do tonight, is go to the statistics literature, uh, it falls under the uh, regression adjusted plus minus, um, though it's not quite the, the hockey plus minus. So, yep, there, there, there it is. Um, so I've got, I've got a model. Um, we're gonna have a response. We're gonna talk about a couple of different responses. Uh, we're gonna have a mean effect. So essentially, that's gonna turn out to be a, a home ice effect. We're gonna have a theta, which is gonna be our zone start effect, right? And that's gonna be for a particular event or a particular shift. Uh, in, 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 in the case of what I'm gonna present, it's going to be for each event. Um, so we'll have, we'll have rank effects, uh, and then we'll have player effects here. The things I'm gonna do are gonna be effectively the impact of home players minus the impact of away players, and then I'm gonna make my responses positive relative to the home team and negative relative to the away team. Um, and then the, those last two lines, lines three and four, are really getting at uh, some score effects. Uh, and a couple of years ago, this is um, the fourth line is an addition there. Um, the note that the, the uh, score effect changes depending on the time left in the third period. Um, so as you go into the third period, you have some different effects. Um, basically, we're gonna have the, those X's there on the second line um, are gonna be indicators. They're gonna be zeros and ones for whether a player is on the ice. So we are gonna know all 12 players that are on the ice and we're gonna try and tease out their impact uh, based upon that. Here I've got uh, HS is home score and AS is away score. The, the zone start that I'm gonna use um, is I'm gonna use the zone start is gonna be a one if I'm in the offensive zone and a minus one if I'm gonna be in the, the defensive zone. Um, so hopefully that, that, that keeps Micah happy in the back. Um, I'm gonna look at, at four responses. Um, so I'm gonna look at expected goals, and for that outcome, I'm gonna have a positive probability of a goal. If I've got a home team shot, I'm gonna make it a negative probability of a goal for an away team shot. Um, the, the, the reason for doing those positive and negatives is to make them agree with those player effects. And so that we are getting things that are positive and adding, uh, if you're on the home team, but then if you're on the away team, then you've got a, a, a negative sign, and then you're getting positive when we have, you're getting negative of negative. Uh, so you're getting positive if you're, you're doing good things for the away team. Um, we're gonna do Fenwick and Corsi as plus one, minus one, same sort of logic in terms of the sign. Um, and, and uh, I don't think I need to define Fenwick or Corsi there. Um, so uh, a note, just a, in those three, we're gonna have different sets of events, right? So for expected goals, I'm only worried about shots. Right. If I've got Fenwick, I'm only worried about Fenwick events, so shots and misses, and goals also, if we're gonna, gonna include those uh, not as shots. And Corsi then that. And then the NV20 is something um, that, that uh, we've done in the, the total hockey rating paper, um, where we look at the effect for 20 seconds after an event happens. Um, so, so some of the, the statistical details, it's a linear model. 
Um, we're going to do basically uh, an identity link function uh, uh, keep the statisticians happy. We're going to uh, we're going to use some ridge regression. So we're going to do some shrinkage to deal with the multicollinearity, particularly with the fact that defensemen play together a lot uh, and dealing with that. Um, we start in terms of the, the all events model with about 250,000 events per year. And we end up with about 1,100 players. Um, so we're, and that ridge parameter, uh, just note there, right, it, 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 we, we chose it uh, after testing to sort of maximize the year-to-year -year correlation between the player. So the players that appear with sufficient number of minutes in both years, we're trying to maximize that correlation between them. Um, we're gonna go through uh, and we're gonna do uh, seven seasons of data. I'm gonna do one year at a time here to look at that, that zone start effect. Uh, again, it's all five on five and there's fancier, fancy stats um, for special teams. We are dependent on the RTSS. Uh, we're, we're taking effectively a pretty big data approach here, um, but recognizing that, yeah, there are some issues there. We tried to take some of the rink issues out uh, by estimating the, the, the effects in each rink. Um, and we've done some error correction and we've dropped some events uh, where we couldn't, we couldn't fix them. Um, so uh, what I have here to start, um, yeah, well, is expected goals. Um, and so I have the effects with 99% confidence intervals on expected goals. So the, what we're talking about here is the outcome in terms of expected goals on a particular shift, right? For the shots in that shift, right? We're moving, um, uh, our, we average uh, just under one and a half percent change, right? In that expected goals outcome. Um, if we've done that, we've got, we've got error bars, We've got there, I've done 99% confidence intervals here. Again, we've got some multi uh, multiplicity here. Um, so I've just used 99% instead of 95%. Um, again, we, we, we see some fluctuation, um, though in this case, all of those uh, bars contain uh, the average that we've got across, across seasons. Um, Fenwick is a bit intriguing. Um, and so we've got the most variation in terms of this Fenwick event. Um, and we've got, a, I think, a pretty surprising average. So we're saying it's about 14% change from starting in the neutral zone to starting in your offensive zone uh, in terms of the Fenwick outcomes that you would expect. Though you can see that that, that estimate bounces around quite a bit. Corsi is a bit more, I think, what we would expect in terms of outcomes, and it's a bit more stable, though, again, we've got some bouncing around more so than we saw in expected goals. Um, I think this estimate fits more closely. So Fenwick uh, is a bit unusual, um, for sure, in terms of its magnitude, but Corsi fits much more with, uh, with some of the other traditional estimates. We're getting about uh, almost 5%. Uh, in terms of uh, what we see, in terms of 5% outcome change in your Corsi if you start in your offensive zone versus the neutral zone. Um, and this is, this is the NP20. This is going to be a metric that's measured in expected goals, um, but expected goals by event. Uh, NP20 uses everything from face-offs uh, to shots to missed shots, blocks, uh, etc. there. And that effect, um, about uh, one in a hundred goal differential there. Um, so you, you think of a, a shift giving you uh, maybe four or five events, it, it's a small change there. Um, but we're getting about maybe, uh, well, one in a hundred there goal differential. Um, so some average estimated uh, effects there. Uh, and I didn't put standard errors on this one. This is just a straight up average. And, and I think the Fenwick, the Fenwick sticks out 
I love Fenwick makes me nervous, for sure. Um, so, so, so uh, you know, I, I went and I took a look, actually, at, at, at the outcomes by zone start in terms of, of percentages. Um, and this is just 2015, 2016. Um, we can see that, that defensive zone starts for Corsi um, decrease your outcomes by about 5%. For offensive zone, increase by about 6%. Again, a neutral zone start, um, a little bit positive there, probably some home ice effect. But the, the, if we just straight up averages, and this is straight up averages without doing all the adjusting uh, that we were doing, we are seeing differences that are getting into that, um, well, 17% moving from neutral zone to offensive zone, and about 14% moving to, to defensive zone. So, um, that, that knowledge makes me a little bit happier with this estimate. That estimate might be a little bit small, though it feels large. Thank you. Um, so, uh, discussion. What are we doing here? Well, we tried to quantify right, this effect of a zone start. Right? We're taking a very big data approach. So in any particular year, we're looking at over 100,000 observations. We are looking at trying to tease out impact of players, and then simultaneously teasing out that impact of players, we're getting the impact of the zone start. Uh, we have first order effects here in the model, but we don't have interaction. The, the model I like to think of as kind of an uber wowie. We are simultaneously adjusting for everybody else that's on the ice and accounting for the impact of those players. Uh, these estimates are, are, are all averages, right? The, the zone starts for Jonathan Tate might be a bit higher, for example, but we're assuming sort of a league-wide average here. So, but certainly we could have player effects. Nice that we get some standard errors. Um, and we can, we can use a statistical model to get those. Um, the, the Fenwick adjustment is dissimilar to the Corsi adjustment. Uh, based upon this analysis, I think that's, uh, it's surprising to me. Uh, I think it's a bit unusual um, there, but it seems to be in the data. Um, and the, the nice thing here is we can make it comparable. So back to, to, to Bacchus and Ryan, right? We can make some comparable adjustments and there's a, a, an adjusted Corsi for Bacchus and Ryan there uh, with standard errors that go with it. Um, so I think, uh, I think I'm good. Thank you. So next we have, who do we have here? Oh yeah. Dawson Springus is a senior studying economics and also a contributor for Hockey Graphs under the name DTM About Heart on Twitter. on here. First one is I'm going to look at uh, predicting how well a line combination will do. And first I'm going to look at a linear model 
and explain why that isn't ideal for looking at line performance. And I'm just going to say it right now, I'm going to refer to a linear model and a nonlinear model. Technically, they're both linear models. Only some of you will actually know that, but just for simplicity, one's linear, one's nonlinear. And then after that, we're going to look at more line composition, and not in the chemistry sense, but in the talent sense. So uh, should you play your best players together? Or would you, the team be better off if you spread them throughout the line? So what's wrong with the linear model? Looks all right right there. You have pretty good R squared. You'll see the axes don't completely line up. It's not a direct input to output. But it looks all right. Two things we're going to look at. Theoretical issues, and then we're going to do a residual analysis. And just to run a quick through what a residual is, you have a model. It gives you an output. The residual is the difference between the observed and predicted. So if you were predicting goal scoring, you say this guy's going to score five goals, he scores seven, your residual is two. So that's the residual is just the difference. So here's that same graph that's zoomed out. And this is where you kind of realize what the issue is. A linear model would just keep going in the sense that it would predict, maybe unrealistically, overblowing it, but it could predict that the line would have over 100% coercy or under zero, which we just know is theoretically impossible. And then this is our residual chart. So you see here the dots show how far above and below uh, a given line performed uh, based on projected. And projected in this case, I use. Uh, score adjusted, Corsi relative to teammates. You add the three teammates stats up, divide by three, that's the projected. But you, you start looking at the top here and all those players, a lot of them seem to be underperforming and at the bottom here, they seem to be overperforming mostly. So that's kind of an issue, that's the second issue for using, for using a linear model is you're not capturing that. And so the second graph we're going to look at here is a cumulative residual plot, which I'm sure not a lot of you have heard of before, but it is a thing. And <laughs> you promise? I Googled it, so there's a paper on it. Um, but what we ideally want here is a jagged line kind of bouncing up around zero, and we don't really get that here. We actually have like a distinct pattern. It goes up, it comes down, it goes back up again. So that's not really ideal. That's kind of an easier way to see that there's something probably off with our residuals. So here's our solution, it's a non-linear model. And I'm actually gonna use a polynomial regression, which is technically a linear model, but I'm just gonna call it non-linear because it looks like it. And it's the same kind of thing we use for uh, the Pythagorean theorem for predicting winning percentage, because just like Corsi, you can have over 100% winning percentage, and you can be below zero. This one seems try. Um, and so for the rest of this analysis, we're going to have to use some cutoff points or else we're going to get ridiculous. You see, if we just left it at zero time and ice, we're going to get some lines that have zero, some lines 100 to get screwy. So I just use a basic kind of thing here to look. When does it stabilize? And I did this visually. So the red line is one standard deviation, blue line is two standard deviations. I just kind of looked at it and said, where do most of the points start falling within the two standard deviations? And I got 150 minutes. Uh, you can actually look close, you probably hardly see from here, but the average is actually above 50% Oops, sorry. at that point. So, good job, coaches. You're keeping the good lines together. Good type of survivor bias. And then, so here's that same graph with the polynomial regression. So, you kind of see our residuals at both ends of the spectrum here kind of lining up better. You're not getting these crazy outliers. One always being above and one always being below. So maybe it's not the biggest difference in the world. We're only dealing with outliers here. The linear does a pretty good job for the most part, but just slight improvement we can make. So here's kind of a comparison of how they stack up against each other. It's not huge, but it helps. And then here's the same cumulative plot. The red is the linear, the blue is the nonlinear. You see the blue does a much better job of sticking to that zero line and less of a distinct. So should you play the best players together? Short answer, no. Long answer, it depends. So how do you go about this? Because it's not, it's not an easy problem. You probably have 
ways that you consider tackling it. I jumped around a few different ideas, but I still on one. So I broke down lines into seven categories. There's some overlap, but based on their makeup of talent. So a good, so a, a good player is one who is one standard deviation above the mean in performance. A bad player, less than one standard deviation. And so we looked at these line makeup. So what if you had a line of all average players, all bad players, all good players, a mixture in between. And since in this model we only have two inputs, well no, sorry, one input. Um, you have our predicted value and then it gives us, we have our estimated value and it gives us a prediction, what we think is going to happen. So we have one beta coefficient, which is basically your multiplier. You put one course C estimated in, how much is the line going to put out? So how much you're performing? If you notice from this first graph, it's not a direct one-to-one -one mix. There is a slight boost from it. But if you break it down to these seven models, which is a crude kind of way of going about it, you have a good player. And in memory of my late partner, as my could make it. Uh, bad player. An average player, based on these stats, just kind of give you an idea. And so yeah, here's the thing. If you look at this chart, you have the beta coefficient, so the multiplier of these different combinations of lines. So for three good players, you're not getting the same bang for your buck, basically. You, you would be that you would if it was three average players. So their ex predicted value again might be higher, but you're also putting a higher input into that prediction, and it's not, you're not getting the same return. And you see it kind of peaks at average and dips near the end, depending on, you get some more extreme line combinations of all good or all bad players. So then what can we do with this information? We can use this thing called linear optimization, which is really just, you set a bunch of rules and it follows these rules and it gives you an output. So it's can be used for like setting your fantasy football lineup. If that's something you do, you say, I need one quarterback, I need one wide receiver. You go to a bunch of rules and it maximizes on some value. So for here we say, give me the highest possible combination of forwards to get the highest course C4 percentage. You have to use each player. You can use each player more than once. And I gave it the option of the 12 based time on ice players for a given team. So it doesn't allow us to directly compare to what actual lines are used because you know, there's injuries, you know, stuff happens, you have to play like your HL call and stuff. So it's kind of unfair. These will always be a little high, but what we can do is using the same linear model, instead of maximizing on what we know, um, instead of maximizing our polynomial seven model version, we can just go back to the very linear version and say, if we just keep adding these players up, what do we think? So it's our flawed model, but we can also maximize lines. So we compare our best possible lines to what we would think our best possible lines are under these original faulty assumptions. So yeah, basic model uses a straight line approach. It'll give us suboptimal lines, and it'll also give us incorrect predictions. So those are both bad things. The new model, gives you your best lines and also a better or correct estimation of what that line will do. And then, so we run this through, we can compare, and these are basically the differences that we get. So on the left here, incorrect pr projecting. So we say you made these bad lineups using this linear model. What would that lineup actually produce? And so, Minnesota uh, wouldn't turn out so well. Um, they would have made these bad lines and they would have thought they were still better than they actually were. Whereas Montreal, I mean, Montreal got cut off down here, but they would have made bad lines but they actually wouldn't have been as awful. And then that is the cost of bad lineups on the right and it basically breaks down to uh, we have our optimal lineups and we have these worst possible lineups and what's the difference in value that these lineups are providing. So Minnesota is obviously the big one there, Los Angeles, Carolina, Boston. Uh, there's about 20 teams where it improves them by at least one goal, which is pretty valuable because 
about a goal goes for about half a million on the open market, depends how you estimate it. But it's kind of restricted in one way because if you don't have really good players, then you don't really have to worry about this. Like Buffalo, for example, like it doesn't really matter. You're not <laughs> getting much better. Um, <laughs> at least another year. We'll be all right. um, and then, so yeah, the summary, a polynomial regression is more appropriate. You're not gonna totally ruin yourself if you're using a linear model, unless you're dealing with the extreme cases. And you should try and spread your talent throughout your lineup to maximize your impact. Because obviously you want to play your best players the most, but you also want to be getting the most value for them. So if you're putting them in a position where they're, what they're giving you isn't as effective, that's also hurting it. And then, so future work, break it, you can do this analysis further, breaking it down to offense and defense. I didn't look at defensemen. If you look at defensemen, it's probably improving the seven models approach. It's kind of crude, it just happened. And then you can use any metric you want, your expected goals, or if you have a more metric line around, you can probably use that if you want to. But uh, thanks. So our next presenter is Eric Cantor. Uh, Eric is from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He's a recent graduate of the Bachelor's in Economics. He stays, stays active in the hockey community through conference attendance. And he's previously attended the Pittsburgh Hockey Analytics Conference, uh, Mises, last year's, last year's RNC Hockey Analytics Conference, and the recent Ottawa Conference as well. Thanks, Matt and Ryan, uh, for hosting us today. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool to be up here. I was reading you know, a goal last summer. I uh, came up with this idea and never thought it would take me here. Um, but we can take another look at what, what am I going to go on this book? Um, another look at roster and uh, lineup structure, um, but a little more of a macro approach, um, something I hadn't really been seen done before. Um, I was intrigued by an article I read of all places, all the stats people might find it funny about NHL.com inspired this, but I promise the stats aren't funny. Um, so, uh, it was just about the success Tim Bay Lightning had with the roster structure of seven defensemen um, in the 2014 15 playoffs. Um, I was curious if that was something, you know, in a small sample or if that was something they had been using more often, and um, just want to take a look. So. Um, here's a screenshot of the article. Um, it was interesting, uh, they mentioned some of the stats that they had used in that 14-15 uh, playoffs. They had used the 7D structure. There were 26 games that they played when they made it to the Cup. Um, 14 of those 26, they used the 7D structure. They went 9-5 with that roster. Um, it was something John Cooper went frequently to after a loss. Um, something Cooper, he, he really uh, preferred and, and kind of was comfortable with that lineup. Um, he said something along the lines of where he could, you know, easily match up his players uh, without that 12 forward. He could switch in, you know, Stamkos or Callahan, whether it's, you know, uh, situation dependent, and try to get that best matchup possible. Um, so, take a look. Uh, just a quick objective and what we're going to be going through. Uh, that my goal was to identify uh, performance differences existed. Uh, with the roster structure was seven defensemen rather than six. Uh, I took about 293 de uh, games of data from 2013 to 2016, and we're going to take a look at those. 
and just see if there's a measurable advantage uh, with this new roster structure. And here's a quick summary. Uh, we've got a table there that shows season by season, uh, the regular season, and in parentheses the amount of times they use the 7D structure. So in 13, 14, uh, half the regular season games, they used it. Um, 14, 15, where I actually got the idea, they had to use it uh, zero times in the regular season, but 14 out of 26 in the playoffs. Um, but in the bottom right there, a total of 92. Uh, 293 games in this uh, three-year sample, so about 31% of the games over the past three years they've used a 7D structure. Um, there's a couple areas to focus that we'll kind of take a look at and show you some stats um, and try to compare how the metric worked out with the 70 versus 60 setup. Uh, the first thing here uh, is just a quick graph that will show you um, games, uh, like I said, 293 games, zero all the way to you know, 300. Um, any or the orange marker is any game that they use the 70 structure. Blue, obviously six. And you can see how, um, like we talked about already, the 14-15 season, you can see that regular season, it's all six, but once you get to the playoffs, a big bulk of that was the 70. Um, and there's a couple ideas, you know, when, when you're talking to uh, people at the events and colleagues, um, just, you know, why, what, what necessitates this structure? Um, Cooper mentioned that those playoffs, uh, Jason Garrison was coming back, he was out for about four weeks, and he wasn't quite comfortable giving him a lineup spot without uh, an insurance when he dressed uh, Nikita Nesterov as a seventh defenseman as insurance. And, um, but so oftentimes the, the injury situation can um, predict or you know, call for this 70 structure. Um, as you can see here on the bottom half, um, it's the lineup from the 2013 14 season. That's the full roster. And every dot on that graph is a game where a player was injured. You can see uh, Stamkos missed about half the season there in the middle. Um, and if you look, you know how it correlates to this when they use a 70 structure on the top. Um, there's a big portion in the middle where Keith Ollie, uh, Stamkos, and, and, and numerous other players were out at the new time where they used this uh, structure heavily. I skipped 14-15 because, like I said, in the regular season, they did not utilize the 70 structure. But again, here's the 15-16. Um, we can take a look. You know, there's that, that chunk, that second interval there. Um, and again, if you, if you drop straight down, there's also, you can see it correlates with a lot of uh, injuries from their forwards. Um, And then the next thing I want to take a look at was, you know, when they're using this 7D structure, how's it affecting how they distribute their time on ice between the defenders? Um, we'll see here with the 60 structure, the, the mean time on ice for a defender was about 15.35 minutes, and it was al almost two minutes less um, when they were able to use that 70 structure. Uh, there were games where, uh, like for instance, Nikita and Estrov, when they dressed him in the playoffs, it was a, in the Rangers series, there was a game that was five to one, and that was when he had the most minutes that series. And um, so when the score dictated his minutes, I think he had about 13 minutes that game. Um, but then again, there was game seven against the Rangers, and it was zero zero heading into the third period, and he had his lowest minutes, I think maybe about three minutes. So um, a lot of different things can, can dictate that distribution of ice time. But overall, just to give you an idea of how it shaped and allowed the, the defenders to reduce their minutes a little bit. And again, um, took a look at the forwards just to see, you know, they lost their full forward there, so how is that gonna impact their ice time? Um, this, I focus specifically on the top six forwards. Um, you know, it's the bulk of the scoring, the bulk of the weight, and just to see how they, oftentimes it was those forwards that were Double shifted on that fourth line with um, Brian Boyle, and you can take a look here. And it did shift the median ice time a little bit, um, but not necessarily as much as the seven or the defenseman. We can go ahead and look here and get into some of the fun stuff. Uh, just compares all those team statistics. Um, these are all five v five score adjusted uh, metrics. Um, 
going through the top, I don't have to read them all through, but, but it, you know, down from Corsi, down from scoring chances, expected goals, you can see, um, you know, an overall increase in every metric uh, throughout. Um, there's a red notation around the adjusted metrics. Those ones increase, but however, you know, allowing more shots isn't necessarily a good thing, but the overall differential, as you can see in the percentage, uh, still remain positive. And uh, just something else just to notice, um, like, like I said, there's about 93 games with the seven defensemen structure. Um, I'm just, just curious uh, to rule anything out, but the PDO uh, with the 70 was 101.2, and the 60, they were, they're almost identical, was 101.28. Um, And again, here we'll take a look at the top six forwards. Um, this is something I chose to focus on the top six rather than the bottom six or the forward unit as a whole. Um, the top six, there's less variables you know, game to game. Uh, more chance, those are the guys, the skilled guys scoring the goals, uh, they'll be more consistent. Um, and also because Michael Peterson said so. Um, and as you can see here, the, the top six forwards, if you look at the change uh, between the Corsi and Benno percentages, uh, the top six forwards received the biggest boost uh, from this new structure. Um, if you took a look at the p-values, ran a t-test comparing the differences in the means between the offense Corsi and Fenwick, the defense Corsi Fenwick, and the team Corsi Fenwick, and um, by far the offense, the p-values on those, the Corsi number was 0 0.04, and on the Fenwick was 0 0.02. So uh, definitely indicated a significant difference in the means there. I'm going to go ahead and take a look. Um, I had taken some of the numbers from um, Corey's all three zone data set. Uh, just to take a look at some of the zone entries and exits that we've talked about throughout the day um, and, and to see how that was impacted with a different structure. Um, if you can take a look there, the carrying percentage definitely stood out to me right away. Um, the huge, huge boost uh, that 70 structure, and I don't know, I mean, all sorts of stuff if you want to talk after or discuss ideas, but I mean, I don't know, you know, it depends on if able to jump in the play more often, um, in the breakouts, or anything more involved with the ice time distribution or what, but um, as you can see, a huge, huge change. Also, I threw in some of the uh, passing data from Ryan and Co. Um, and again, all across the board, these metrics are increasing, and I'll go back here one second. The only number I was, is I was running these numbers like, wow, everything uh, increased, increased, increased. The one number that didn't increase was the expected goals forward for the defense. Um, it decreased slightly. But if you can see there, the expected goals against um, also just decreased, which if you take a look, um, mostly against statistics, um, increased as well. So the differential there, again, um, although that was a decrease in the uh, measure, um, the differential is again made up by the complement. And then to go ahead and wrap this up, um, I think just the uh, potential competitive advantage that you could receive with the 70 structure is something uh, that might need to be explored further. Uh, that's something I, I went into with a question and came out a lot more. Um, you know, why, why is this happening is the, you know, reduction of that 12th forward in his ice time, is that allowing the metrics to increase um, the possession numbers and everything else across the board? Um, and then just as far as, you know, the, the new era of the more mobile defensemen, you know, is there something that could complement that kind of style where you have defenders that are going to, you know, jump in the rush and they're going to help on the break and they're going to carry the puck up. And if you can distribute the, that ice time a little more, um, is that something that could complement that new style and new structure. And then just one quick slide about uh, future exploration. Um, you could look into all sorts of things, or you know, the fatigue factor in all this, you know, like I said, with ice time, um, more injury analysis, player analysis, um, try to get more stats for the zone <coughs> entry exit, uh, passing data, tracking any other sort of tracking data. Um, and then even building some models um, and also discussing like the idea behind 
and like a game theory analysis, you know, where you're gathering, you know, if that seventh defenseman or, or you know, eleven forward, you know, from the injury of a risk or an ejection, and you're down, you know, to either five D or ten forwards, you know, where do you weigh that into account? Is that something we can, you know, evaluate or put into a quantitative measure? Um, but overall, um, I think, like I said, just, just raise more questions. It's something I was curious about. I uh, didn't expect 31% of the time for them to be using this structure. Um, raise more questions and something just curious about to keep looking into with other sort of exploration and um, just skills we can dig up. And then one more thing, and thanks to uh, Ryan and Matt and everyone here at IT. Um, Doug Ensley is a gentleman who's helped me out with uh, some of the software learning. I, I've been doing this by hand and through Excel. Uh, so he, I went through and learned R, uh, which was huge. I counted, I went through and counted the rosters, how many defensemen for each game for the playoffs that year, the first 14, 15. And um, I don't think I would be able to do 300 games by hand. So uh, that, was, that was huge. So thank you, Dr. Ensley. And then um, Michael Peterson, I, Talk to him quite a bit throughout different conferences and get some ideas from uh, Tampa Bay Lightning and then Shuckers as well. Um, and then here's the data sources. And that's it. Showed the chart where you showed the injury, game injuries of the various players in the Lightning. Where'd you get that data from? I'm curious. Um, there was a whole, it showed a whole. On the last slide there, um, <coughs> NHL injury oh, database, they had a nice um, database for injuries um, and also some graphs and different metrics that they used. So I got a follow-up question for Eric on injuries. Um, based on the injury graph, it looked like they used a lot, of, I guess they used the 7D um, structure a lot when Stamkos was out. Um, one, what percentage can you estimate of the 7D structure was due to Stamkos? And then it seemed like they, they improved offensively in that 7D structure, but it's sort of immediately counterintuitive. If you can stand for this, so I if you can comment on that. I mean, yeah, as far as I wrote the numbers out there, it was 30, about 30 games I think I tracked. I looked at specifically when he was out that 13 14 season, and as far as specific numbers, um, yeah, the team numbers jumped. Uh, it was a 53.7 penalty. 5403 top six and then 5395. The defender numbers were dimmed off the charts those 30 games. And I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to try to put in some sort of explanation of why. Uh, we were discussing the Ewing th theory earlier. <laughs> so maybe we get some elaboration on that. But um, as far as, you know, this, I don't know much about it. I just learned about it during the lunch hour. But um, Andrew and Sam we're discussing when the star player is out. You can correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's just, um, yeah, I, I had not heard of it. So it was something. Ewing was out of the mix lineup, but this was a better team. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if that's something that can contribute. I mean, it's really hard to put a finger on exactly what caused uh, the increase in stats. It really is kind of counterintuitive when you're losing an offensive player like that um, for those numbers to increase so drastically. Um, but, you know, just kind of another thing. Those numbers across the board were overall improved, and they're doing this, you know, more so when 
there's injuries. You know, that kind of makes, raises more questions in my head. It's not, you know, it's a depleted roster that they're doing this with, and it, it's even still more successful. So I don't know, it's really hard to kind of put a finger on what's really happening there, you know, whether it's reducing the ice time from that 12 forward or just the, you know, adding the defensive ability, you know, screen the time ice. There's so many factors that I don't really know. I definitely don't have an answer right now, but it's something I keep looking into. Uh, so this is a question from the internet for Michael. Uh, why did you use bridge regression instead of a lasso penalty? Um, because uh, the, the programming was a bit easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it really started out as an undergraduate project. And so for, for an undergraduate to be doing the coding uh, really was the initial reason for it. Uh, and so we've got that sort of legacy there um, redoing it, we probably do something like an elastic net. Uh, this one's also for Michael. Um, I don't understand how the zone starts have a greater effect on Fenwick than Corsi when there's more Corsi events than Fenwick events. I just don't understand that. So yeah, so you're looking at an average event. Uh, and so you're looking at the average per event. You know, why does that outcome happen? Uh, I don't think I've done enough uh, to do that, to, to, to know exactly that. Um, you know, certainly the difference there is blocks. Um, and, you know, is it possible that blocks are sort of more noise than anything else? That might be one, one possibility. This is for uh, Eric. Uh, do you think that it's possible that the improvement in the 7D system um, might come from the uh, Tampa organization undervaluing Kuchera, Palat, et cetera? So this is for uh, Dawson. So how do you, it looks like you, you, know, you obviously got a, a better fit by, by using a you know, quadratic function. But uh, have you ever considered using more predictors or more of a multilinear model to see if you could sort of reduce the residual even further? That's not this one I thought about. It's probably if you wanted to take what I did and take it a step further, which I would encourage people to do, because it's fairly basic with what we said. But you know, you could add, you can take that same model, add dummy variables, you could add interaction variables. Um, you could change how you define what a good player is, what a bad player is, you know, different combinations of lineups. So there's a lot of ways you can tackle it, and it's not, you know, I take a basic approach to it, and there's probably some more complex answers out there. So, you know. Uh, this one's also for Dawson. Um, I just don't understand what the beta values were. If you could quickly explain what um, those represent. So it's well, it's um, really just a multiplier. So uh, trying to figure like a general. So let's say you had a model for how many hours you study, quote, uh, trying to predict how well you'll do on your test. So let's say for every hour you study, you increase two percentage points on your test, that your data value would be two. So in this model, you're putting in the estimated 
course-to-form percentage based on the line makeup, and you're trying to predict the actual course-to-form percentage. So it wasn't actually a direct one-to-one -one exchange for most of them. So you know, having an estimated 50 didn't necessarily give you an exact 50. And so that was the point of that showing that as you change the line of composition, uh, what you put in wasn't the same as what you got out. It actually varied quite differently from 1.5 about average to having three good players and a drop down to about 0.5. So you can still get really high because those lines with three good players are going to have really high estimates, estimates off the start, but you're not getting that same bang for your buck. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we'll be moving to our final panel of the day. The uh, four esteemed media members come on down. Uh, Bill West, Scott Cullen, Alice Lucan, and Carolyn Wilkie. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Wenger. I'm another math professor here at RIT. I work with Matt Hoffman. Um, so I figured I'll do a very quick introduction, just make sure everybody knows who's sitting up there, and then we'll let them introduce themselves and get started. So uh, reading from left to right here, uh, we have Carolyn Wilkie, who is the site manager and editor for today's Slapshot. Uh, next to her, we have Allison Lucan, who is a freelance blue freelance bluejackets.com. Uh, writer and also the editor and writer for BuckeyeStateHockey.com. And then uh, next to Allison, we have Scott Cullen, who's with TSN. And then uh, next to Scott, we have Bill West, who is a beat writer for the Pittsburgh Tribune and Review. So uh, I figured we could start off by having you sort of talk a little bit about your background and uh, how you use analytics in your writing. Um, so I have no media background whatsoever. I didn't go to journalism school. Um, so I went, I have a marketing background and I actually got into hockey writing through analytics. Um, I uh, co-write a blog, uh, Deep in the Heart of Hockey. Um, and it's mostly jokes and stuff like that, but it's where uh, I started putting up some you know, very, very, very basic analysis of the Dallas Stars, and um, just got further into hockey writing through uh, analytics, and uh, started writing for today's Slapshot, and then they brought me on board as the uh, managing editor for the hockey site. Um, and so, I mean, anytime I write anything, I still kind of come at it from an analytics perspective, since that's just what I am, and what I know, and, and how I perceive the game. Uh, so I also have no formal uh, journalistic background and started writing about off-ice hockey stories um, so the guys could write about the hockey um, and eventually found myself really frustrated because I couldn't understand why what the definition definition of shots on goal was. That didn't make sense to me. There was more to count. There was more to look at. And so I too just started incorporating statistics into my writing as a way to explain the why behind what we were seeing or what we were hearing rather than grit or hard or works hard, uh, I wanted to dig deeper into that. 
And now specifically with uh, the Blue Jackets, we also want to make sure that we're educating people on some of these underlying uh, systems, logics, analytic findings so that we're educating the fan base more than just people liking players because they like a player. We want to help them understand why. Okay, so um, I'm the third one who doesn't really have one more journalist to say. <laughs> I, uh, Amy, you're <laughs> I, took, I took economics in school. Um, but I, and I played hockey um, in university, and but it was kind of as I was finishing up that I was realizing that I kind of like I did this in my the school paper that was the extent of my, my training, and I was like, yeah, I kind of like this, and but I couldn't find a job doing that, that you know, a couple dozen clips from the college paper. So, um, so I I was working in, in finance jobs and. You know, I, I eventually gravitated my way over to, to TSN, but I've always been, numbers have been sort of the backbone of my sports fandom. You know, from the time that I looked at the back of hockey cards to, um, you know, the, there was a, a year when I was a kid when I broke my leg playing baseball. I spent the whole summer playing strutting back baseball, like an obscene amount. And that kind of thing just has always been part of my fandom. and. That's how I, I approach writing, and, and so when um, when TSN when they, they decided they wanted to focus some on, on fantasy sports, they didn't they didn't really ask for any applications. They just sort of shoved them at me and said, "Okay, this is what you're going to do." And I went, "Okay, that's great. I love fantasy sports." Um, and then kind of as time has gone on and analytics has um, expanded in hockey, you know, TSN's had more interest in it. And again, you know, they haven't asked for people to do it. Just sort of been, you know, look, you're going to do this, and I say, yeah, I, that, I like that, and, and so the, there are all kinds of opportunities, but in, in some ways the opportunities are there because so many of people who have you know, real journalistic backgrounds, they don't care about the numbers in the same way. You know, they, they, they look at uh, stories and, and they, they approach it far differently, and, and so that's sort of how I end up in the role that I am, is that I come at it from a different perspective than, than a lot of the other journalists. No, okay. Um, I guess I'm the, the soccer panel. I, I did go to journalism school um, and started a newspaper right after I graduated. And uh, I started paying attention to analytics because it's information. And um, really, our industry, that's we deal in. That's how we uh, make a living. So I didn't see a reason to ignore it. All right. So I guess uh, another question we can sort of go into is, do you have a feeling, some of you touched on this a little bit, is there a way that using analytics and using it maybe quite a bit gives you sort of a unique voice in sort of the industry or in the field and people have so many different sites they could go to or newspapers they could read? Uh, do you feel that there's a particular way that it gives you an advantage in attracting readers? You look at me, so I guess I start. I, you're just on the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely in, in print media, uh, newspapers, traditional or mainstream media, I guess if you want to call it that, um, it's a difference maker because, as I'm sure most people here know, uh, there aren't many many people who haven't embraced it yet. It's um, I don't know, it's too complicated, I guess, or scary, or, you know, strays from what a lot of the people in media do, of course, I would say the median age is 50, 60 at, uh, at times in newspapers. So it's um, it's intimidating for them, whereas you know, the younger generation, we want more information. Uh, so I, I just kind of carve out a little niche um, that it's, it's a way to uh, educate people. Yeah, and kind of to build on your point, I think there's so few um, beat writers who, who focus on analytics. And I think of yourself, I think of James Myrtle, uh, Global Mail, and Trump, and I, I'm sure there are others, I'm not trying to slight any, but it's, um, you know, in Toronto, there are 50 writers covering the Maple Leafs. And James Myrtle stands out as the one guy who pays attention to analytics and actually um, gives it any attention. And so that's, I'm more likely to read his story than I am to read any of the others telling me what's going on with the neighbors. Because the other people who are going to tell me what's going on with the neighbors are going to tell me what player X said or what you know what the coach told them. I can already see what the player said or what the coach said. I don't, I don't need you to write that down for me. 
Um, and so I, I like somebody who's going to look at it in a different way. And, and as I said, the numbers speak to me. And so that's th those are the writers that I read. And so when I'm writing something, I mean, all, all my art for me, I, I write a column called Statistically Speaking. So guess what? There's a lot of numbers involved. And, and my favorite part is that I write this column, Statistically Speaking, and I get responses telling me, no, numbers don't tell you everything, and so on. So I'm, I'm aware. <laughs> um, but it's the title of the column, it's always there. And, and so, um, but that's always going to be part of how I want to address an issue. And, and you know, there'll be all kinds of other issues that, I, that I'm not going to touch on. But my, you know, there was, a, after the Sudan trade uh, this summer, I, and you know, there's been a few other things with Montreal Canadiens where I, I wrote a thing where I said I'm not part of the culture club. That, like, Montreal is so hell bent on um, changing the culture to the you know the almost exclusion of ignoring the fact that skill is what is winning in the NHL. Like you know, Pittsburgh Penguins, Stanley Cup champions or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 <laughs> no offense to the Penguins, they might be a bunch of great character guys and so on. They were a really skilled hockey team. Like that's the team they wanted because they're really good at hockey. And, and so I'm, I'm not buying into the idea that you can win because you change the character of, of the team, that I think you really need good players. Um, and, and, and that goes beyond Pittsburgh, where Chicago has won three cups in seven years. And it's because they're really good at hockey, not because they have some great culture about guys who don't like to lose. They're the guys who don't lose because they're really good. But anyway, I, so I, I write that type of column, and I get, you know, I got a lot of feedback. <laughs> Um, and some from people who totally agree and, and that's fine with them. A bunch of people who have been around hockey for their entire lives or, or at work, and they're like, oh, well, don't you know that you know, if you have somebody on your team at work that, that, that you know, brings you down and so on? Yes, but it doesn't prevent me from doing my job. And, and I think, you know, yes, we can all appreciate that no one wants to work with a jerk. Um, and that can be a factor of, you know, in player acquisition and so on. Like you can't just look at, you know, somebody's relative course and say, okay, that's the player we must have no matter what. But you have to consider the, you know, how much somebody is a jerk and how much that affects the entire team. You know, they, they have to be a serious jerk for that to be a, a huge factor in, in their value. And, and that's, so yeah, I think that um, traditional journalists tend to apply so many things, and I guess we'll go back to the Penguins again. If you look at the way that Phil Kessel got you know, kind of run out of Toronto, and, and all these issues about Phil Kessel and this and how terrible he is and the, the made up hot dog story. All, the, all those things, and, and it comes down to it is that yeah, but the Maple Leafs were much better when they, with Phil Kessel on the ice. Like, and the Penguins were much better once they added Phil Kessel. And so you can come up with all these reasons why Phil Kessel you know, might not have been the ideal hockey player, but it doesn't trump the fact that he was the most skilled player the Maple Leafs had and was a really good player and a contributor for Pittsburgh. Perhaps on the other side of the coin, coming off the season the Blue Jackets just had. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, having the analytical voice out there um, was, was key on two fronts. I think it was valuable for people who wanted to understand what was going on um, by putting out information the way that I and my fellow site mates did, we found people wanting to understand finally what a lot of these words and charts meant. And so exposing that dialogue as opposed to the many narratives about why they lost their first eight games um, to understanding the impact of your goaltender not being on top of his game um, is really important, particularly when you're dealing with the emotions of what was going on. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning that Again, in the context of what's going on with the Blue Jackets and did last year, I think it, it really speaks to their confidence in giving me a platform to put out work of people like Ryan and Micah and Sean and exposing their fan base to really understanding to dig deeper and understand the why. So I think that's uh, what it's brought, um, having that kind of a voice. Isn't that always the, the way it's the struggling team? that they start looking into analytics, like I mean, Edmonton is like the hotbed of hockey analytics because they've been terrible for so long they've been trying to figure out why. And, and so you know, when the team kind of falls off the cliff and, and the results aren't there, the fan base is kind of sick of hearing why we try to be their best. They want to know why, why are you still terrible? 
Can you just compare Columbus to Edmonton? <laughs> you're not, you're not there again. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of in a little bit of a different situation because I, I don't make a living writing. I, I'm, I'm the editor. So I, I read stuff about every team, every league, uh, and I read all different kinds of writing too. That's, that's the other thing. I think there's a very valuable place in the world for what coaches said and things like that. And there's always going to be readers of that. There are some people that's what they want. Um, and because they think it's, you know, it's, uh, there's something to be said for like straight from the source reporting, right? Like you're never gonna get rid of that ever. And you shouldn't, there's definitely a place in the world for it. Um, and I think, but it is really nice to see well-reasoned columns and analysis and, and just to be able to read through somebody's opinion and have them be able to back up that evidence, or back up with evidence and facts and, and things like that. And that just lends a lot more weight to an opinion um, because otherwise you get, Phil Kessel was bad because he eats a lot of hot dogs. And, and so, and it, if you've got numbers there, you're, you're just more believable. All right, so, uh, Another question would be, are there new things coming up in analytics or new ways you'd like to use them in your writing and the reporting um, that you're excited about? All right. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the advantages actually, I think what I think um, actually all three of us and then, and then unfortunately Bill doesn't get, is that most of our stuff is online only. And um, in an online space, you actually get a lot, you can use a lot more technology. Like we can embed YouTube videos, we can embed Vines, um, and all the data that is tweets, anything like that. It's really, really easy to visualize what your, your the point you're trying to make or illustrate the point you're trying to make, whether that's a prospect, whether that's one of Micah's graphs or, or one of my own or whatever. It's really, really easy to put that in an article, to explain it in an article. And that's something that you don't get in traditional print media because you can't, because in newspaper, every inch is valuable real estate. Whereas in a blog post, and that's actually one of the things that like, when we bring authors on to today's Slapshot, like our typical blog post is about six to 800 words. But if somebody's like, oh, I'm right, it's getting close to 2000. I'm like, that's okay, you have endless scroll. Like it's fine. <laughs> like if what you're saying is valuable, I'll just take out all the parts that unnecessary and then we'll just have the greatest article you could write. Like that's kind of how, that's one of the one of the biggest advantages of having an online only space as opposed to traditional media. Yeah, I think um, that I'm, I'm most excited about the evolution that the field is taking into the tracking and the micro stats. Um, a lot of what I do, similar to what the, this panel talked about this morning is translation. I can't walk into the room and ask Nick Foligno why his course he was so good. That does not resonate at all. Um, <laughs> but by the time I explained to him shot attempts and what that means, et cetera, I, I've used up my time. So it's a lot easier to talk about the context of passing and the context of entering the zone and the context of you know a specific setup on a power play or something like that. So I like that the data is not only more meaningful, but it also actually makes it easier for me to communicate with people who don't they don't use the same language we do um, in analysis. And it's more meaningful to them when I explain what we're talking about. We talk about tracking now, which means we get better answers um, and more information that we can share in our writing. Yeah, I agree that um, being able to kind of dig deeper to find out, and I've you know, said this uh, in, the, in the past when I've you know, been trying to explain to a radio host or something about, you know, what is Corsi and why does it matter and so on. But people are like, Corsi isn't the answer though. Like that, that's what starts you asking questions. And in, in most cases, you know, it, if it lines up with what you already think about a player, you probably don't dig any deeper. But if all of a sudden this player who you think is great does a terrible course, well now you want to find out why. And, and because people start doing things like and Ryan's uh, passing project and Corey Schneider's um, all three zone project, and you can start finding out some reasons you know, why doesn't this player um, you know, generate better shot differentials. Then, you know, we might have to keep going to, to find out you know, long-term answers about, you know, whether it's, you know, who he's partnered with as a defenseman, or, um, you know, maybe it's, it's the way the coach is, 
you know, teaching under one of the offensive zones and waited for it. There are all kinds of reasons why, but the fact that we started digging down and getting um, more granular information, that's what um, excites me about kind of the future. Is, you know, it's, it's awesome the stuff that the Lions have been able to get from 21 games. It's awesome that you had it for 82. And so, so get on that one. But <laughs> 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 in my spare time, we got it. Um, so, but that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. Like, if, if you, I go back to kind of as far back as I started at TSN in 2001, you know, of course you know, nobody was even talking about then. And to, to think that you know, we're getting all kinds of details that, that lead into that kind of number you know, now, and you know, I, I think that's there's a lot of progress there. I, mean, I, I, think, I I'll think it goes slower than I would like, but that's you know, my limitation. I guess I co-sign everything that was just said for the last <laughs> responses. Yeah, micro tracking or micro data um, is kind of the next frontier, whether it's Ryan passing stuff or new zone entries and exits, uh, goalie, you know, stuff we've always talked about several times today. You you always as a member of the media want to give the audience more. So, you know, the, the people that are doing the legwork in terms of tracking are giving us that opportunity. As Scott said, it's, it's still probably too small of a sample size to say anything definitively when you're, you know, sending this information out to the thousands of people. Um, but it's really encouraging and it's it's exciting, you know, to have a, an underappreciated player and be able to say, well, yeah, he doesn't score much, but you know, look what he does on the floor check or you know, look how good he is at retrieving the puck, things like that. It's uh, it, it's just that much more um, enlightening. All right, Bill, I think you were uh, headed towards, was that, we're coming back, we're coming back. <laughs> I forgot the snake patterns. <laughs> yes, yes, you declared you liked it, so. Um, but going towards this idea of, you all have fairly formal platforms in, in which you're speaking to people. Um, how do you deal with the idea of bringing in new analytical tools or new types of statistics, um, having them be valid as you're broadcasting them out to thousands of people? Um, how do you sort of deal with that responsibility? What do you think is sort of the appropriate way to go about it uh, in such a public setting? I, I guess one for clarification, are you asking how um, we put this you know, analytical ideas out there and I guess just have confidence that people will? Well, uh, so I, I guess there are a couple different things. One, there is the are you at I could make up a statistic for you today and tell you it's cool and it. tell you go tell, tell the people of Pittsburgh this is this is what's happening. Um, so there, I mean, there are issues just of sort of validity, um, but then something else that uh, certainly came up in the data visualization panel and things like that. Um, there's an education aspect that has to go with this, especially when you're talking to not this self-selected group but to very large audiences. So how do you sort of deal with sort of the responsibilities there? I guess the answer is slowly. Um, you know, again, the, the readership by and large, most people want to know the score of last night's game. So I'm, I'm not sure they care much at all about the, the analytics unless you really give them a reason to. Uh, so you, you have to ease them into it. And you can't just, you know, mix Mercat measurement is great, but I can't just throw that out there and store it because people know what the hell are we talking about. Uh, so, you know, even the, the simple things like calling a Corsi a shot attempt. It's a step in the right direction because people understand what a shot attempt is. You call it a Corsi, people go, well, Corsi, is that, is that, a, you know, is that like war? Is that a, a thing? What does that mean? So um, it's always about simplifying and trying to make sure that the information you are putting out there is still pretty pedestrian, I'm sure, by what a lot of people here um, you know, grasp. And, and then you just really have to take faith that, again, the, um, the, the data does provide some insight. And if you're just throwing stats out there, and it, it doesn't really, you know, enlighten anyone in any way. And, and at the end of the story, it's like, all right, so the Penguins won. That's cool. Um, then you didn't do your job. But if they're able to take away from the story of Penguins won because they possessed the puck, or I don't want to say possessed the puck, but they, uh, you know, had significant zone time and were much better about getting um, you know, zone entries, then I think you've done your job. I would agree that gradual is probably the way that the audience uh, expects it um, or, or will accept it. Um, but if you, you know, decide on, on kind of to pull out of the blue something you saw 
at one of these conferences and go, okay, well, this is, you know, this is now how we judge players. You know, people who've been watching hockey for their entire lives, they're not going to buy in. I mean, this goes the same way as, you know, I was trying to get coaches to buy into something. You can't just show up and say, boom, this is the, this is the way we um, give out the hockey players now. Um, but I think from the, the Bill's point is that if, you, if you're using it to help explain why they won, why they lost, and you know, how these underlying numbers play into that, um, you'll find a more receptive audience. And um, it, it's kind of feels like it's back to what I was talking about, about the, the granular level of the, of the information is that if, um, is if you're trying to explain it about this player and people you know, don't know why, you know, people think Shea Weber is good or you know, somebody who's a really popular player, it, it helps to have some evidence to back it up. And you know, maybe they're going to disagree, but they know you're not just pulling this out of the air. And, and you can you know, pull the data and say, okay, well, here's, here's why people are down on Shea Weber. And you, you don't have to agree with it. But we, we're coming at this from a solid foundation, and it's not just um, you know, grabbed out of thin air. And as you were saying, Carolyn, like people want evidence. That's one of the things that I guess attracts me to, to having numbers is that, that feels a whole lot more uh, uh, like evidentiary backup as opposed to I'll say, well, I, I watched that game and Shea Weber was awesome. Well, so when somebody says, no, he wasn't, you know, yeah, I, I need something else to, to measure. And certainly, sports is all about measuring things all over the place. So, Using that to do that is almost natural. Yeah, I think for me, I, I perhaps approach it a little differently when you're when you're around a team more, perhaps well, like Bill and I are um, day in day out. I, I kind of have a, a sneaky approach to my slow world domination plan. Um, <laughs> I'll give you an example that um, Jody Shelley, former Blue Jacket, is now color commentary for game broadcasts, and so I'm sure you'll watch plenty of Blue Jackets game broadcasts. Um, but he, I started to hear him mention numerous times shot attempts, shot attempts. Coach Lavalette always told us we need this many shot attempts. So the next time I saw him in the locker room, I said, Jody, you know, tell me about that. Because he had really, again, a former player, very old school, um, had really, uh, base puncher, had really <laughs> demonstrated a, a desire to understand the analytic side of the game. And he said, oh yeah, and he told me this whole story. He said, but. I said, well, now, shot attempts, Jody, is that blocked? Is that missed? Is that shot? He said, yes. And he goes, but I don't understand all that coursey stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, think, I think that speaks to something that Bill said, too, is the, and what the Viz panel said earlier. It is incumbent on us to make the connections to people in the language that matters to them. You know, some of these words are off-putting. Some of the brilliant things you guys can do with numbers are off-putting to me. I'm not only not a trained journalist, not a trained mathematician. So, um, but looking for the ways to connect the dots with a lot of what people are seeing with the research and support that this group of people has done is something that I think is so important to helping people understand this. And I also think that's why panels like this are so important. I try to make it to as many of these as I can because I do like to go cutting edge a little bit. So it's, it's times like this where I hear about things like what Ryan's doing or you know the newest approach Micah has for, for zone starts or whatever it is and follow that Council with some of the people I've been able to fortunately build relationships with and when we feel confident in the data or the theory, start to examine that from the Blue Jackets perspective and hopefully present that in writing. So to kind of piggyback on that actually, um, one of the things that I guess again, just going back to my form of media, it makes, it, that's really fun and we're starting to do a lot more on today's Slapshot is we're starting to see a lot of these posts talking about like why a specific player is good or why a specific team is good and then able to insert either the video or the gif of them doing that exact skill and that's one of the things that's been really really working for us and and we have the flexibility and the freedom to do that and thankfully we have um, the NHL who's not taking their thing abilities unlike the baseball uh, so far, um, but yeah, I mean, we had we've had like some really good response to that. So we've had like posts on what makes um, Barkov so effective, and what makes his you know his you know line with Yager and and Jokinen just so good for the Panthers and part of that aggression. And you saw it today too with with Ryan and his presentation and just having those gifts of Colorado and Florida, like that just drove it home, right? And so uh, taking advantage of the medium that we have. It, having just those, those kind of technological tools 
can be used so well to explain analysis, and, and there's nothing that bridges that gap better between traditionalists and analysts than video evidence. All right, so what sort of response do you get from various parties, including readers and uh, perhaps players or coaches, for those of you who are a little more embedded with a particular team? Um, what sort of response do you get? How do you think people react to, to the work that you do, the, the use of the analytics um, in general? I run the gamut. Um, but you're not a real analyst until somebody tells you to watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not the gamut. Like, there's some people who are, like, super into it. They're like, okay, now tell me about this team. Okay, now tell me about this player. Uh, and then there's some people who are just like, well, uh, I, just, I just don't see it, you know? Or, or even just like, well, numbers don't tell you everything. I mean, it, it, and that's fine. Like, that, there's room in hockey for all of those people. And, and I think that's... Something that grates on us a little bit because we are so numbers focused, but at the same time, like you enjoy the game the way you enjoy the game, and I'll go enjoy the game I I enjoy the game, and we'll see who's team wins. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I've mentioned this a couple times as well, and I would give Carolyn a shout out also in that I think that is a real tool to start the communication. I get a lot of after I put something out. This looks really cool. I don't know what it means, but I assume it's good. <laughs> um, and that usually will start a communication. You will always get the people who say, I, my favorite is someone who's debating rate stats don't sh are bad because they don't include time on ice. That's for another day. Um, <laughs> I can only fight so many battles. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, what is interesting is, is finding ways to connect with the players and the coaches um, for me. Um, some players, if, particularly when they're really doing well, I will seize the opportunity to explain to them something they're doing and say, and that's called, you know, even back in the day, that's called Corsi, or if you hear this, some players just don't want to hear that. They're just not interested, and that's cool. Um, John Tornarella is the current head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets. <laughs> um, and I will say, in all seriousness, while he will ding on analytics, when we talk about the philosophy underlying the numbers, and I don't know what he sees from, um, from their front office um, numbers wise, but when we talk about the philosophies, he's actually on board with some of the ones we've talked about. So again, I just don't use the technical terms. I use a lot of the explanatory things. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, I would agree that the, the response can run again. If you can get it all kinds of positive response, well, this is really insightful, that's great, and then um, I, I don't know how, how harsh your responses are. I get far worse than if you watch the games or, or, or so on, but I think after a while, it, that stuff kind of, you know, just goes, runs off the back. Like, I, I don't, and, and like, I don't say that easily. Like, in, in the first few years that I, I was writing and putting things out to a wide audience, and you get somebody who tells you how stupid you are and how awful this is, and well, I think it was really that bad. And, <laughs> but, and, 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 but like I, the response I, I would often get to them is like, I don't write to the television shows that I don't like and tell them I don't like them. I just don't watch, right? So if you don't like what I'm writing, don't read it. And, and you know, I'll, I'll live with I'll live without your your pain for you. Um, but um, you know, there's there's a, a wide range of response you can get, and a lot of the times like. I, I get responses sometimes through like other people. Like I all you know, have done power rankings forever. And kind of word gets back at the end of the my power rankings. Like my, my email's on every article I write and I'm very accessible on you know, you can always find me on Twitter. And you know, but I'll never hear about it from them. And, and there was once one NHL woman once complained to me directly about, about their power rankings. This, this is a long time ago. Um, I, ex I explained, you know, why this was. I take injuries into account. The goalies out, blah blah blah. And a while later, the goalie came back and went up and did not touch my rankings, and, and everything was fine. <laughs> but I was like, I can't believe you know what I'm so that's what I was And you know, I haven't had the, I would say, the misfortune of any players being terribly upset about what I write. I, 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 I try and write 
any of the things that are right that are critical, I probably I soften them as well, I would say, by comparison, like I, if, if I see what some blogs write about you know, how terrible this player is, or how terrible that player is, I don't call anything terrible. You know, a lot of times when I say they're overmatched, or they're asking him to do too much by playing in the National Hockey League. Uh, <laughs> But I don't, I don't want to, you know, be too insulting to the player, and so, so sometimes that is the. Uh, um, but I think because of that, you know, I, I haven't had players also showing up at TSN in the pitchfork trade to, to take me out of here. So. I would say that uh, the comment that if you don't like it, don't read it, and also not calling people terrible, is not standard for the internet as a whole. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Very classy stuff. Um, I've, I've been very fortunate with my experience because Pittsburgh, um, you know, hockey analysts obviously they're still kind of growing and, and fairly young as a field. Uh, but you know, baseball, as most people know, has been analysts heavy for a little while longer, and the, the Pirates um, are known as a team that utilizes them a lot for small markets. They have to find ways to kind of cut corners. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that a, a coworker of mine has covered the, the Pirates and their use of analytics pretty extensively. So it, it made, um, I guess, open door for me to kind of do it a little bit with the, the Penguins. But also this website, War on Ice, maybe you guys have heard of it before. Uh, has, some, yeah, has, some, has some pretty smart people uh, running it who are based out of uh, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. So. There's a, a lot of things that align for me as far as my first year on the beat and um, you know, being able to, to jump right into these topics without you know, people being like, who's this idiot that's citing all these crazy stats that you know, names we've never heard. And I just had one more comment about that too. The internet is a very, very, it's really odd because if you think about the way media is distributed on the internet and, and I probably know this better than most of you guys because this is literally my job here. I get 70 characters in my SEO to make a statement. So 90% of the responses I get to stories that are put out on official feeds are either a response to a 120 character tweet, because you 115 character tweet, because you need 25 characters for your link. And or the, the response on Facebook to whatever it is, those you know seven words you get to put in your headline. People, a lot of times, like, I mean, click-through rates are awful. Like, I hope, I mean, if anybody ever plans on going into marketing or anything like that, conversion rates are like the gold mine. You can get click-through rates up and conversion rates up from a sales perspective, like, you're gonna make yourself a lot of money someday. But, and then so in journalism, like, it's the same thing. like. Your, and it's, it's brought about the rise of clickbait, which has brought about the rise of skepticism. So 90% of the responses you're seeing on Twitter or Facebook aren't to the story. They are to those 115 characters that you're using to try to incentivize people to click your link. Yes. All right, so at this point, I'd be happy to open the floor to anybody who might have questions. for Allison, but really for anyone. Um, how do you balance accurately telling the stories of the stats and also keeping up a positive relationship with the players, especially in a situation where the stats may not be complementary towards the player, the team, the coach? Um, how exactly do you balance that? Because obviously you have to then face them in the locker room, and if you write something bad happen, they will tell you about it. It's a great question. And I, I will share um, a word of advice that an actual journalist, um, Aaron Portzline, who covers the Blue Jackets, gave me. He said, whatever you write, you have to be ready to go in the room the next day and face it. Um, and there are things that you write and you are saying to yourself, I'm pretty sure this person's going to see this and I, I still have to write it. I think the key is, is a lot of what Scott already shared, is that th th these are not bad people, right? It's not like they went out and intentionally tried to do something really horrible. Um, and so a degree of humanity in your writing, I think, is important. 
Um, I will also probably lean more to the educational side in a situation like that, um, particularly on the Blue Jackets uh, site, um, in terms of here's how this could have been done better, let me go into the depths of, of what we learned from this measure, what have you. Um, on Buckeye State Hockey, I have a little more freedom. Um, but again, it, it's just a reality, and I think if you're being fair, and I think if you're being respectful, I think that um, I've, I've written some things, but I've also been fully willing to go into the room the next day, and, and they may say something to you, but I think, I mean, these guys are in on, on the game too. Like, this is not their first rodeo, and I think they'll respect if you go in and stand behind whatever you've written the following day. Hey, uh, so I guess this is more particularly for Bill, but it, it's an issue for everybody because even on the internet you have infinite space to write all of the words. There's only so many words somebody's going to read. But in print media, you're much more restricted with your word count. So when you are trying to get your audience more on board with the metrics, the stats, uh, the analysis that you're using, uh, how do you figure out a good balance of like between every single time you you write out the entire definition of Corsi versus just only using the word Corsi and hoping for the best? Uh, first step is I don't use the word Corsi. Um, call it a shot attempt. It solves that whole problem. In terms of how to explain anything more technical. Uh, I just try not to use anything that's too complicated of a, a concept because yeah, you're going to lose people immediately or spend a significant number of words just trying to explain it. But I mostly have faith in the, the public and you know, read. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, I, I trust that as long as they're interested in the topic, they might do the homework or at least after me explaining it the first half a dozen times, half a dozen times the story. They'll just get it, and if they don't get it, they'll do a little research on their own. So it's uh, it's somewhat a matter of believing that people are smart enough to get it. And I would I would just add, um, I'm more of a feature writer than a beat writer, but what we will usually do is start off with one piece just about the stat itself. Um, for example, when the shot assist idea came out, one whole piece on that featuring Blue Jackets who were measuring well on that on that statistic, but just one whole feature on the idea to introduce it into the lexicon so it became something we then referenced over and over again. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just wondering how you guys see the role of um, coaches in front offices in terms of being uh, facilitators towards the broader uh, kind of audience accepting stats. And I'm thinking specifically kind of in contrast to something like basketball, where 10 years ago it was not kind of commonplace to write about things like true shooting percentage. And now every NBA home office thinks about this, the ones that don't really stand out because they're you know, so far behind the times. And now all the mainstream writers, NBA writers, like all the big ones use advanced stats. Like this is the thing. So like, I'm, what I'm wondering is, how much of it is home office adoption from your perspective, the signal to the fans, A, how important is that? And then B, from your perspective, so you guys are writing about stats, do you see yourselves as kind of evangelizers for this kind of thing? Like is is it important, you know, for the future of covering hockey that the fan base kind of, you know, become more familiar with these things, these things become more kind of friendly? Well, I, I think that if you had coaches or GMs who are more publicly positive about advanced stats, you would, you would get far more acceptance because there are a ton of people who watch the games and and they just buy into what the coach and GM say. If the coach says this is important, then that's important. If the GM says this is important, then that's important. And so if the coach says, look, our shot differentials are really something we need to work on, then no one's gonna argue with, with it. But if you say, well, how are you measuring shot differentials? They say, of course, and then they are terrible. Um, <laughs> that's the, um, you know, if you got that kind of uh, discussion though from a coach, who, who, we would kind of regularly bring that up in, in press conferences, and, it, and it, there are some up there who, who do, which is, you know, make it like there's none. Um, but you have a lot of old school coaches who, who bristle at, at any mention of it whatsoever, and, and I think 
that until that sort of gets replaced, um, until those guys grow older and, and out of the game, that there's always going to be some resistance from those fan bases. You know, the co fans are, are quite willing to listen to their coaches uh, in their market and, and hear what their coach thinks is important. And so if, if the coach says us wearing our black jerseys matters, then okay, well, let's do it, coach. <laughs> and, and so I think if the coach buys in on, on stats, then you know, the fan base is, is likely to follow. I think if you look at say, some of the teams that are you know, more obviously um, using front office you know, based on stats, if you look at Arizona or Florida or Carolina, some, some others, that, that if those teams you know, accomplish and, and have success, well, then you're going to see their fan bases go, well, yeah, I see, this makes sense. They're, they're listening to their stats people. And I, I, I think that's kind of how this is going to progress in, in, in part because it's happened in other sports. I mean, hockey is hardly the first one to be going through this because it's been more likely to last. Uh, we just, hockey really hasn't had our money ball moment yet. Like, it, it's, it's clear the Penguins team made a lot of changes that were based in statistics, but they were, they had Sidney Crosby before that. So like, you can't really say that that's, that this is the watershed. It's when, when you get a team like Arizona or Florida, those would probably be the two that I would put my money on. When they start winning, that's when we'll start seeing a lot more publicly open discussion from front offices about the awards. Folks, so on a media perspective, then, uh, if we take, if we consider the fact that people are mostly uh, looking for old-fashioned articles versus your statistics, if we look on, uh, I don't know, on the page views or uh, in audience, uh, how does the analytic content compare to the traditional stuff? And B, Scott, can I kiss you for what you said uh, about skills versus... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so I keep track of, of my site's page views quite a lot, and I will tell you absolutely nothing does better in views than trade speculation. Zero. Like I think I think my best or my best page views for uh, the entire year so far was when everybody thought Stamkos was going to Buffalo, like, and that was like 300 words. Like these people are talking about Stamkos going to Buffalo. Here's all this insider info. Um, but that said, one of my best year for the year was actually a statistics and video combined breakdown of why Patrick Law should get fired. So, and and it was you know it had you know all the analytics in it. It was 1,600 words, and it had at least five or six different gifts showing they, how bad they were at defense, and, and it got massive views and, and it took off very well. So it really it really does depend on timing. Two. So, it, it, the more you could have done about Susan and Weber the, that day, the better you were in it to be than if you could put something, even something really, really good together five days later. Good thing was nothing else happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see obviously all the stats from BlueJackets.com, so I don't think that the stats. For the stats articles are the best, but I do know that um, the article that the first article we did in introducing Shisis and the passing project um, was one of the best performing articles on bluejackets.com during the season. Um, and on the flip side, on Buckeye State hockey, some of our best performing posts are goal breakdowns, where to Carolyn's point, it's analysis, it's a video, it's screen capture with annotations. So those will really draw big, big numbers as well. But yeah, the stats piece is, granted it also featured Alexander Wenberg, who many find very attractive, so those pictures help. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's very, very well. Awesome. It, it turns out that at, at TSN, our, our analytics pieces tend to do pretty well. Um, and and not, not like, I would say the day to day, if I you know, write a recap of last night's three NHL games, and and there's nothing terribly eventful happens, well that one's not necessarily going to do that well. But if, if you have a, a decent 
look into it, and um, or if it's something that people can refer to quite a bit. I, I've done over the years. I've done kind of draft pick value columns, and they get linked and referred to over and over you know, until I update and do the next one. It's it's kind of amazing the, the lifespan they have. Um, but that's you know I, well, the thing that I think about is that people who are into analytics. They're really diehard fans. And so they're far more likely to click through and read these articles than the casual fan who you know, might see a headline and go, okay, well, that's, now I know what's happening there, right? I saw the headline. The analytics fan is willing to, to click through and, and spend time on it. And, and so for, for that reason, the, the measurables seem to work out for, for the P's and W's, basically. I think the, the one important thing, um, certainly that I try to do, I used you don't write an analytics story versus a traditional story. You know, you, you just write the story and you can use whatever information or evidence you want. Um, the goal, uh, I would say, is to blend the, the analytics of the data with you know, kind of the human elements. If I'm writing a story about Justin Schultz, I can go into detail on you know, what he did and didn't do well at Edmonton and why he might be useful Penguins. But you're also going to write about Justin Schultz and the fact that you know, Oilers fans were booing him. So you, you mix it all together and, and hopefully it's just a good read. But in terms of readership, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different factors. Any headline with Crosby in it usually is the most read uh, story that day. So it, it's, it's tough to gauge um, whether our work resonates based on what you Crosby said to give Justin Schultz a break. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> if, if, if Crosby you know, came out and, and said analytics are awesome, that would be like, <laughs> so if, if you're speaking to, say, a coach or maybe even a player or a member of the front office, you want to get some more insight into what they're doing with all these areas you're talking about, um, I wonder if you, if any of you have a strategy um, on how to get more information out of them, especially when it's not in their interest to share that information? Um, I haven't cracked Mike Sullivan yet, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, step one would be don't bring up analytical terms. You know, if you start going to Corsi, Mike's actually been good. He's brought up Corsi and Fenwick before, somewhat in a dismissive way. But uh, <laughs> you know, he, after saying he, he's aware of these things, he, he had a really good um, you know, couple paragraphs about possession and really what he will talk about and, and the best way to get information out of him or GM or players, you know, anyone that's on the insider hockey kind of thing, you, you want to talk concepts um, because these guys love to talk hockey, whether it's X's and O's or again, just the, the subtleties of the game. So, you know, at the end of the day, these numbers represent things happening on the ice. So you talk about what happened, not what necessarily the numbers reflect. So that's, um, you know, to the degree that I've had any success so far, that's been the way to go about it. Yeah, I would agree. I definitely talk about the what happened or the behavior that I'm trying to explore, but that's how I would describe it. Um, the only other difference that I usually will make is if I'm trying to explain a strategy, like zone entries, if I'm exploring that, I am gonna talk to the individuals who are good at it. Um, but if it's something that someone is very good at, you know, for all their bravado, players don't always want to extol their own virtues and, and talk to you for two and a half minutes about that. So for example, if I'm exploring Alexander Wenberg's passing, I didn't speak to him, I went to Scott Hartnell, who was his most frequent line mate, and said, what do you see? Tell me what he does with his passing. How does it help? And asked all the elements that uh, Ryan's work had been exploring and got his take, um, so, and again, all in terms of how the game is played, not how many shot assists did you see Alex give you know, on this, because Scott Hartnell's a better throwback and he's just probably gonna laugh at me and walk away, so. <laughs> and then pull it. <laughs> for charity, for charity. <laughs> a few months ago, a professor from Quebec presented a paper in which he um, uh, presented these results that he did. Uh, he interviewed 
coaches, mostly junior um, and minor league coaches, about their use of analytics. And I had talked with him about his paper and the results. And one of the things that he suggested and he thought was an interesting question to possibly pursue was the language barrier and simply tr uh, train, translating these terms. Obviously, there's probably no word in French for coursey. Um, so how do you how do you translate these sorts of or do you find like the language um, being a barrier to some of the adoption of uh, hockey analytics within your audiences? Or? I think as was said uh, during the visualization session, you, you want to speak their language. So if you're, let me make sure I understand the question correctly, you're talking about talking to the coaches about things and how the... No, no, sorry. Um, it was more about whether you, you I had to answer one question. It's about um, the language barrier specifically between French and English and audiences that are reading or listening to your work. And if that is a barrier, you feel like, to um, audience appreciation or audience adoption of these um, sorts of analytics. I think, I think there's actually quite a few very good past writers who, who use a lot of these concepts in, in French. Um, and I can't, off the top of my head, I, I remember his first name, it's, it's all weird, but uh, yeah, there you go. He, he's brought actually, like I, he's linked my stuff before. Um, he's really quite good at integrating those in French. So I would assume that the barriers that exist are, are the similar ones language-wise in that coaches and players don't want to hear Corsi, they want to hear what happened in the game. Um, and from a junior perspective, uh, I think the bigger issue is more of uh, what you've heard from the coaches today as far as time and, and staffing constraints. Um, junior stats are awful. Like, I don't know if anybody's, I know a couple people in this room have definitely looked at them, um, but I, even just the basic fact checking that I do for, for some of the prospect stories that I, I have to read through is so hard. Like, I mean, you get elite prospects, but then you have you've got no time on ice, you've got nothing. So um, it, there, there's a lot of constraints, I think, but I don't think French to English is one in particular. I, th I think you're going to run into the same language constraints that, that everybody else has talked to. So, uh, so you touched on the piece about uh, how it's clickbait and there's a world where Skip Bayless is a, technically a journalist. Um, how would you, uh, kind of piggybacking on an earlier question, how successful would you say you guys have been in your respective fields in permeating your audience with advanced stats, having it be widely accepted? Obviously there's probably still a ways to go, but how far do you think you've gotten so far? Uh, from personal experience, um, about two years ago, no, year and a half ago now, I had 300 Twitter followers. So, uh, they, I, almost 4,000 now. So for me, it, it's it's kind of grown exponentially as a personal brand. Um, and, and I can't say the same for today's Slapshot because we don't just do analytics. So we're, we're do all kinds of reporting. And, um, but it's definitely something that you get known for, and then you can you can fall into a particular trap of being a little too niche every once in a while. But it's definitely, I mean, Michael McCurdy. You can ask him. I mean, he's he's built a brand around himself for being known for data visualization and awesome dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming, Michael. Not letting you off the hook. I still see you. <laughs> a dance has been requested by the YouTube viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, that in terms of introducing people to want to dig into this information and read what we're writing, I, I feel like a broken record, but I, I do appreciate the work of Sean, of Micah, of Carolyn, having the visual snippets to introduce people to concepts and garner interest helps get people to click through. Um, and we have seen a similar build in our traffic for the written pieces, and we do face a lot of the challenges Carolyn shared, but having that visual introduction, not only to the concept, but to the voice that we're using, I think has been very helpful. At TSN, I think, I think we've done all right, but uh, talking to my patients before, like, I think we could do 
so much more. Um, but it's in, in some ways that it, as hard as it is for you know, teams to start adopting it, it's hard for a, a big media company to, to adopt something new because the people who are making decisions at, at TSN, they've been around the game for a long time, the same way coaches have been around the game for a long time, the GMs have been around the game for a long time. And so you know, while they might buy in and they might, you know, we had Travis Yost to, to write articles for us, and, and between Travis and I, I think we, we do okay. But I think, you know, I always think we could do more. And, and quite frankly, I think we could do a lot more. But you know, only so many resources to go around, and, and they sort of decided this is this is the amount for now. And I think you know, being the platform that we have at TSN, I think there, you know, there, there have been opportunities that, you know, when as, as stat sites continue to kind of pop up and, and go back down, if, to, to have one on, on TSN where, you know, TSN's not likely to go away anytime soon. So it would be nice to have some stability in that regard. I mean, look, I, mean, I was all very optimistic when the NHL.com started adopting the stats, but uh, <laughs> less optimistic uh, at this point. And so, you know, for all, for all the hopes that I, I've had and, and kind of still have that, that we can do better, I think we've done okay. I just, you know, I, I wish we would do more. Travis, yes, food takes. And I guess that's <laughs> it's probably good. The that 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 um, it was a really good year for, for you know, the Penguins, or I guess introducing the readership to uh, analytics for the Penguins because there was such a marked difference in the season when they made the coaching change. I'm sure everyone has, has seen various ways uh, whether through charts or just straight numbers. They were not a good team. They were largely, I guess, lucky you could say under uh, Mike Johnson and then, you know, with uh, Mike Sullivan, they became this great possession team. So, you know, anytime a team makes a run in the Stanley Cup, you can get a lot of people paying attention to them. It's just the nature of the business. Uh, but for them to, to do it in a way that aligns so well with, I guess, analytical concepts, um, it just made it that much easier to sell to people. And you can't walk around Pittsburgh and hear people talking about PDO, but um, I think it's just the, the opportunity is there. People are willing to listen to it. All right, so we have time for one last question. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I want to apologize on behalf of my discipline. Because as an academic statistician, I've seen 100 years of people coming up with the most awful, awful names for things. Like anybody who's ever heard the term statistically significant knows that it doesn't sound like what it actually is. And there's a lot of people, uh, like, let me put it this way. All the good stuff that I think we came up with at War on Ice that had good names, we just stole completely from other people. I think it's like Scoring Chances was a standard name. Um, Danger Zone, we, we borrowed half from on the lanes and half from the lungs. <laughs> <laughs> and then the war was term we took from baseball. But all in all, I wonder if the brand, if the naming or the brand name didn't actually make much of a difference. Since what it sounds like is maybe there's attitudes on behalf of coaches and general managers and everyone to kind of stick to what they know no matter what it was called. But at the same time, I'm looking at a bunch of people who are marketing experts one way or another. And so for the sake of the room, if you were gonna go out and invent new stuff, is there a perspective that you've seen one way or the other that you think would help sell the work that has already been done? Uh, I, I, I debate about this a lot because I do, I agree, uh, uh, make coursey shots again. Um, I, it's not my original joke, I'm sorry, I still have from Twitter, like eight people tweeted it this morning. Um, I loathe the term shots on goal. Loathe it. Um, and, but I think, I think there is a, um, there's something to be said for having a descriptive name. There's also something to be said for branding. Um, we call it Jello for a reason, um, even though you know, we all technically know what gelatin is, um, but no one says that, right? Um, we're not going to a department store, we're going to Macy's, you know, something like that. 
So if you have a stat that's good enough and different enough, um, and I'm gonna pick on Nick here because I love picking on Nick, um, adjusted goal saved above average per 60. You can't use that. It's too short. First and foremost, if you're trying to make a good chart, you're taking a half of it with that term. And I, 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 I he's, he's, he's try and, and he's, you know, it, people don't like naming things after themselves, but there, there is a certain um, easiness to it, right? Like you know what it is, and and, and frankly. Even though we all rail on make Corsi shots again, we all know what Corsi is. And if you Google Corsi, if you're if you see it in an article and you wonder what Corsi is, you can Google it, and it is the first like what is Corsi? It will come up. Corsi is a well known and understood concept statistically, and or at least in the hockey analytics community, I should say. So to say Corsi to anybody you're talking about stats to, or even just to say okay, what is Corsi, and you give them one definition, which it is like all shot attempts just call it Corsi rather than saying all shot attempts. One, you generally have to tell them once, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm of two minds. Like try to make the name as simple as possible. Um, and, but I think, again, you, if you have a stat that's new and very different and not reliant on concepts that have kind of been, you know, all over the place, and you know, scoring chances are basically more dangerous Corsi. Like there's no point in like, making up a brand new jello type name for that. But if you're doing something fairly new and very different, you can go ahead and name something different. Yeah, this might be a slightly different take, but I think that it's not so much the name, I think ease of use is important and, and distinctness is important. But I think particularly when we talk about sport, some people just want that to be fun and they don't want to have to think about it, and they don't want there to be math behind it. They want to have the magic of the, the final game-winning goal with two seconds left in double overtime to win the Calder Cup, which happened, Oliver Bjorkstein. <laughs> um, but they want that magic. Um, you know, even Josh Flynn, who's with the Blue Jackets, he said, you know, some people just want to go to a baseball game and have a beer and watch the game. Some people want to get into the statistical side of it. Um, and I think there's just a human nature element to that, that will cause people to resist. I have a friend who I almost punched because he said, not everything's measurable, Allison. If you've ever been with me in the stands for a game, you know that I'm keenly aware because I'm ridiculous. Um, but I think there's just a human nature thing when we talk about sport, because this isn't your taxes, right? This isn't measuring profitability per se. Um, it, it's someone's enjoyment. Some people just don't want that messed up with any kind of structure, if you will. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of of the mind that I, I would prefer names that are descriptive. Like I, when, when the NHL.com did, did brought theirs in, and I, I think I, I wrote a piece that said, like, we can scrap the name Corsi because somebody who's coming to it you know, from the outside has no idea what Corsi is. And the beat, and you know, I got emails from people saying, yeah, well, but, you know, if they made it color or something. You know, but like I look at baseball stats. You know, none of the baseball stats are named after people. They're named after what they are. And so why can't you just, you know, like, like a home run is a home run. It's not named after the guy who came up with the name home run. And so I, I, I just, I thought that, that would make more sense to have stats that way. But honestly, you know, like Kendall said, it takes two seconds if you care, if you care about it enough to, to find out what it is. So I, I think sometimes it is brought up as a bit of a, uh, red herring, or this is why this isn't working is because of the name. Because you know, as course you've been around this long, if you still need you know uh, an explanation for what it is, you really don't care. Uh, my other my other main concern with descriptive names is that nearly everything in hockey is based around shots. So you get three or five different stats that are all abbreviated SA. <laughs> like, no, literally, I had this conversation on Twitter, so it was about the shot assist metric, and it was being abbreviated SA for 60, and they were like, wait, isn't having a high one fast? <laughs> yeah, and it's like, okay, just step back for a second, and we gotta go through the numbers real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but that, so that's the other, yes, the other incentive, is like, if you're, if you're naming something brand new, you've got to make sure you're not stepping on toes. 
shows, I was literally about to say my favorite new stat name out there for all the security purposes was shot assists, and now you kill it for <laughs> so, uh, let's thank our members of our team. There are cookies. There are cookies. Yes. In the age group. What time do we start back up? Can we start back up on the schedule as we start back up? Wait, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. 3.15. Scribble is large. I don't use my uh, space
only ever left with that. Right? So it's like, it's like,
I got caught telling a story earlier and people online were asking questions. <laughs> and today's Slapshot. He's an advocate of using graphs to help develop insights from data, and he's also the guy who's been filling a Twitter timeline with data viz after data viz, or at least one of them, um, and also some great updates on the conference. Sure. Yes. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, again, I apologize in advance. Is, is this loud enough? I just talk like this? Yeah, should I? Thank you. So, hi, everyone. Uh, again, apologies, I've been filling your Twitter uh, timelines if you've been following me today. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to talk about Austin Matthews today, but I thought this was the right picture to get started with. Um, my presentation today is on drafting overagers. Um, I got interested in, or I've been interested in the draft for a long time. I think it's sort of an exciting time in the off season. Uh, well, if you're a Leafs fan. Um, and this year, the Leafs did something that drew a little bit of attention to what might be seen as a bit of a market inefficiency. Um, so a quick background you're on it, in case this isn't something that you're as passionate about as I am, which is definitely possible. Um, Jake Goldberg, who wasn't at the time, but has since become the assistant general manager for the London Knights, uh, tweeted this out right around the time. Uh, 
of the draft saying between the time period you can see 50% of successful forwards picked after round two were re-entry, overager players. Uh, so this got some buzz that he was saying this. It came right around the time that Hayden Speak uh, wrote a post for Maple Leaf Hot Stove. Uh, and Hayden Speak um, is also the uh, gentleman who runs prospectstats.com, if you've ever gone to that site to get uh, data on things that are in NHL. He also provided me with some data, and I'm going to kind of speak against some of the things that he said. He's very open to providing me with the data to do that. So again, the beauty of working in this community is that people are willing to share their data, even if your purposes are nefarious. So thank you to him for that. All of the work that they did led up to uh, Kevin McGrand, sort of a known beat in Toronto, uh, and he wrote a post linking to them saying that it looked like the way to go in the draft, at least at a certain point, was to target overage players because there was an inefficiency, people weren't appreciating uh, how likely they were to turn out to be successful NHLers. So what I want to do is uh, pull out a card in a couple ways and see if it actually holds up in any way that we should care about long term. So this is just from Hayden Speak. This is just from uh, the research that he had done. So we're looking at a time period between 96 and 2008. The players that I'm talking about, I'm only considering CHL. And this is to mimic what Hayden did. He limited himself to just the OHL, QMJHL, WHL. Uh, there were some switches to the CBA during this time period. Um, some weird things where players who were six years overager were drafted in the draft. Uh, and so we're excluding those players from the data set just because it messes it introduces a lot of noise. When he focused in, he used uh, this criteria, and again, sorry to Nick Mercat, uh, we're dropping goalies out because goalies are weak. The inefficiency that he found was, in the first couple of rounds, um, you find that you're better off to draft a first age eligible forward or defenseman, but it looked like if you went third to seventh round in the draft, the percentage is actually tilted in the favor of forwards and defensemen turning into successful NHLers. And we're using a pretty baseline description for success here, but this is something that's come from some of the work that uh, Michael Schuchers has done in the past, um, and actually Scott Cohen as well, where we're defining success as difficult to do across positions as number of uh, games played in the NHL, and we're using a cutoff of 200 games. So this is the inefficiency that they found, thinking you're better to go with an overager in the late rounds. They seem to turn into 200 game players more often. This is something you should do. That's the error. Okay, so um, I'm a known Viz abuser, and after the data Viz panel this morning, I feel like I should have been holding myself to a higher standard, but I'm doing too much. My best thank you. So this is what you're looking at year by year in terms of number of players that were actually drafted. Uh, from the CHL per year, how many were overagers in their first year after the draft? So their oh, first year re-entry or second year re-entry is the bottom bar. This is just the raw numbers. And you can see it's not very much. We're looking at a small set of people in each year that were drafted in their first year or second year after their first year of eligibility. It peaked around uh, 2002. And this is the same thing again, but it's just expressed as a percentage to give you sort of a relative sense. So you see 2002 is kind of the height. The numbers are a little bit blurry. I'll tweet it out after, but you're looking at about just over 25% of CHLers that were drafted that year would qualify as a re-entry player. So the research that had been done previously focused on the rounds. So you look at first, second round, go with the first year eligible, you go with third to seventh round, you should be looking at overrangers because they turn out more often. But we're not really confined by thinking about draft picks in that way, because the draft doesn't really you know, stop at the end of the second round, aside from TV, I suppose. So the draft doesn't stop and reset and everybody has to you know, do something new. The draft goes pick number 59, 60, 61, and you keep rolling, right? So we're not confined by thinking of it in that way, that it's a first, second, third round pick. We can look at it in other ways if we find some compelling or interesting reason to try that. So for me, and I'm going to butcher uh, perhaps Mr. Shuckers' work 
He was kind enough to send me the data long ago, and I didn't tell him again my nefarious purpose, but here it is. Um, so again, this is data that was done by uh, Professor Shuckers on expected value of draft pick per pick. Everything that you see that's really like uh, fonty and colory, that's me, so you can yell at me about it. Please don't yell at him. Um, in his expected values of draft pick work, we, we can see the biggest differences happen within the first 24 picks of the draft. There's as much difference in expected value if you're just subtracting pick by pick between the first and third, between the third and six, between six and 11, between 11 and 24, and then afterwards, steep drop. So this gave me the idea to look at the draft not as round one, round two, round three, or in groups of 30 picks, but I thought, what if we look at them in bins of 25 players instead? Sort of where we see that major drop off and then long valley in draft pick expected value. This is also convenient because the data set starts in 1996, and there weren't 30 teams. So we kind of get around the fact that the number of picks in a round changed during this time span as well. And what we'll see, and I'll focus in closer on these graphs, it does zoom in. Um, successful first year eligibles come in the first 25 picks. Defensemen, you can find them maybe a little bit later in the first year eligible. But for overagers, the only success that you're going to find is if you find an overager that for some reason is ranked in the 25 first picks of the draft. So this is the first year eligibles. If you look at the average player that you draft in the first 25 picks, the first part, second, 25, so 25 to 49, 50 to 74, 75 on. This is just first year eligible. So defensemen, if you are drafting, the average defenseman that you get in the first 25 picks uh, will on average go on to play about 480 games, give or take. We see the same thing for forwards, that if you're drafting one in your first 25 picks, the, the average player here is turning out to give you a lot of NHL games. For forwards, you're gonna get in the next 25, somebody who averages maybe a bit over 200. Then after that, you kind of get into the crapshoot. And we can see this, that if you go to any random pick, you find a star some years, a lot of years you find nothing. We you know just sort of as a general rule, uh, something I've tweeted out in the past that about one in five picks turn into a successful NHLer, but they're highly concentrated right at the beginning. For overagers, it's kind of wild. If you find an overager, and this is blown up again by very small, uh, you know, one or two or three players can really blow this up because we're looking at a small set of tabs. So again, you know, sample alert, uh, as Matt had said earlier, I'll use it here. Um, for forwards, for overagers, you just don't see a lot of difference in the average player that you're going to draft in these groups of 25 picks. It kind of just sort of hangs on a long way. You're as likely to find a successful NHLer on average kind of throughout about 150 picks. But, and this goes back to something that Goldberg said in his tweet, um, I think that there are some limits, excuse me, to evaluating only based on games played. So what does it look like? Well, let's say you draft that overager because you found some reason that's compelling to pick that overager. Well, what are you getting? What is that actual player looking like in the history of the draft? What have you gotten when you've done that? So this is points per game on the Y and NHL games played on the X. This is all CHLers drafted in the time span we're looking at. So you see far out, uh, Joe Thornton, Patrick Marlowe, Sidney Crosby's owning the NHL points per game up there for this time period of drafted players. So you see these excellent players. They're marked with a blue star. They were drafted in their first year of eligibility. Now it's messy, but I'll give a filtered view in a second. There's uh, the yellow squares. Those are players that were drafted as a first year overager, 
and then the red circles, uh, those are two years. So they're a year again after the year. The blue, the first year eligibles, these are the stars. These are the players that everybody knows and loves. You take a look through some of the names, I'll send it out. Latalia, Richard, Stahl, uh, Spezza, they're all in there. But if we reduce to just the overagers, the list of people that have actually come out as an overager uh, isn't the same kind of group at all. So maybe you've got your 200 NHL games played out of them, but what scouts have shown, I suppose, is that they're pretty good at figuring out where the real talent is, where their star players are, and if these players were missed an entire draft year or two, it was for good reason. So the best of the best that you're finding in their overage years uh, there's uh, the delightful Matt Cook, <laughs> killing it in the NHL games played, shrug emoji. Um, Chris Neal hangs way out, Jared Stahl, Dennis Weidman of the Vicious Crosscheck is there, Ryan Callahan, uh, David Kahn. So you're looking at the you know cream of the crop here for overage talent. And if you're not feeling very inspired right now, that's my point. <laughs> Now, uh, this is one last breakdown, and I'll, I'll just pass over this one quickly. Um, I broke it down in another way, and I couldn't bring myself to delete the slide, but I mean, it was definitely on the line. So <laughs> this one shows um, the percentage of 200 game players and the percentage of players that scored 200 points. So if you're looking for that quality NHLer that uh, goes on to play a lot of games and score a lot of points, the top row of top dot is all rounds first year eligible forward. So if you're not sure what to do, you should draft a first year eligible forward. The only dots that compete as sort of likely to give you games played and points um, is an all round first year eligible. So that's the green dot hanging out there. So it doesn't matter what round as long as they're a first year eligible. Then the other one that sort of hangs out far is past round one, an overage for it. So again, uh, you want somebody who's a first year eligible, and if you can't get that, if you're really stuck on an overage, they better be a forward. Okay, so now I thought this is a lot of graphs and something that's usually fun with this sort of thing is if I can bring player names and maybe even a roster. So this is far less academic, but maybe way more fun. I use Cap Friendly to build the all-star team of overagers that have been drafted during the time span that I'm talking about. I randomly pay them all $2.5 million, which is about average. I hope you have no qualms with that. So if you took an all-star team of first-year eligibles drafted, you get the big names, Crosby, Thornton, Marlowe, Stamkos, Getzlaff, Giroux, et cetera, the stars that we know. If you were allowed to pick an all-star team of all overagers that have been picked in this time span, you get this. Right, so like, it, it's not a, a fancy model per se, but I feel like the descriptive power here kind of speaks volumes, right? <laughs> this is the best that teams have done drafting from the CHL, uh, you know, the study that we're using, the numbers that we had to work with. This is as good as you can do. You might want to bicker that maybe Merrick Spatos deserves a spot higher up in the lineup, I might agree with you there. <laughs> this is the all-star team. So this is the team you're putting against, Getzlaff, Crosby, Latang, Subban, this is what you have. So, you know, Jason Demers, I have you know, lots of reason to think he's gonna be great in Florida next year. Do you want him on your first pair playing against that team? Probably not. And then this is just one final view. I graphed their, uh, for all years that are available at Corsica, shout out to Andy Perry, who's been tweeted along with us. For all years of data available in Corsica, I took their average Corsi and their average goals for percentage and plotted them. And the only players that come out sort of on the plus side of 50 are Jason Beers, you know, Wayne Simmons is close, Ryan, Ryan Callahan's up there, David Perron, Matt Cook surprisingly hangs around the break even mark. And everyone else, you're looking at players that are by and large players that you don't need to draft. So I'll wrap it, well I guess I should go to my conclusion if I'm gonna wrap it. Um, there's little compelling reason based on what we've seen 
in the past, well, 1996 to 2008 of data, there's little compelling reason to bother with an overager at all. First year eligibles are where it's at. So I would say that there isn't really a market inefficiency that the Leafs have uncovered here, probably. Overagers, if you're drafting them, they better be a forward, but even still, those overagers seem to have a ceiling. So scouts have shown they're pretty good at identifying that this is a talented player, and if they pass them the first time over, it's probably because there's a limit. And then my last thought actually contradicts everything I've said in a way, so maybe it's a weird way to end, but I'll do that. After pick 25, the expected value, is, as we know from work done by better people than me, is very low. The expected draft pick value after 25 is you know, nothing compared to the first few picks. And so, if a scout were to say to you, this is my guy that we need to draft in some other round, it's actually probably okay to do it because you don't expect very much value from any of those picks anyway. And so if there was some compelling reason and that Matt Cook was really their guy, you're not really expecting much out of the pick anyway. So in a sense, you can almost see the argument. But know that you're getting somebody with a, a ceiling and a limit to what they can really do. And I'll just finish by saying thanks to Matt and thanks to Ryan for putting this on. It's an incredible amount of work, so thanks very much, guys. And thank you for listening. Hey, Mac, you do the light. Hmm? The light. Yeah. Okay. Um, our last speaker, Mike of Life McCurdy. He's been introduced already. Um, yeah. uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I have the, the distinct nervous pleasure of being the last speaker today. Uh, and before I get started, I would like to extend. Uh, just to echo what Sean just said a moment ago, uh, and thank Matt and Ryan and everybody here at the Rochester Institute of Technology for putting on a fantastic conference. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, I am going to talk to you about drafting incentives. So this is the second talk that's going to be about drafting. Uh, it has nothing to do, uh, mercifully, it does not overlap with anything that, that almost anything that Sean talked about. It doesn't have anything to do with who you draft. It has everything to do with how you draft. Uh, many of you who have seen a number of my talks will be familiar with the fact that my talks generally don't have a point. <laughs> the, this, is, this is a character failing of mine. The, I, I have a knack of getting attached to things uh, and then discovering that they're not that important. And, and then I tell people about how they're not important. The, this talk, to my great pleasure, is completely the opposite of that. I flashed onto something which somebody else did. I think it's amazing, and I'm going to convince you that it's a good idea. Specifically, we're going to change the draft order. The rough idea is, is if you're going to have a draft, then you have to have some sort of order. You have to have some sort of method for deciding who gets the better picks. So there are a variety of methods that have been proposed. Different leagues use different methods. The NHL has changed its method in the last several years <coughs> in various different attempts. Uh, and now, uh, you know, economics, as we know, is mostly mostly nonsense. But there are still some some little takeaways that are useful. In particular, that people respond to incentives. And so, if we want if we want people to act in a particular way, it doesn't do any good just to tell them. We have to give them incentives to do this. Uh, my children, changing the subject completely, are two and four, and uh, and they do not respond especially well to being told what to do. But they do respond to incentives. Uh, like also NHL teams do, in particular. And so we say NHL teams, we talk like this, and we say, oh, teams do this and teams do that. And now teams, you know, teams in the old Seinfeld sense are just laundry. The, but, you know, the people who make up the teams, they all have a different pile of incentives. Every single person who's affiliated with the team has a different incentive, strictly speaking, to all the others. And these incentives are frequently not aligned. In fact, let's take, let's take a really broad view of a team and include uh, its ownership, its management, its coaches, its players, its staff, and its fans. So the broadest, so this is what people sometimes call stakeholders. You know, everybody who gives a damn about a particular team. The, 
and, and incentives for those groups aren't always aligned. So we're gonna make some, some broad-based assumptions. This is a very, uh, a very macro talk. You've seen me give some micro talks where I talk about, you know, for instance, I did some work a year or two ago about, about zone start and that, and that was all very micro, micro work. And this is very macro, macro work, and you're gonna start to see that it's very sort of as the crow flies. Uh, so we're gonna make some assumptions about, uh, about incentives. The, so the, the drafting that we have now, I call plain drafting. It's plain in the sense that the teams with the fewest points get the best picks. That's the current, that's how we do it now. Or more to the point, that's how we did it a few years ago. And the incentives of all of those people are not in general aligned. In particular, they're not very well aligned when you have a bad team. So the assumptions that I'm going to make are uh, that the owners of the teams care um, largely about money, but also about prestige. The, we talk a lot about as if all, as if people who own businesses, and, and of course, uh, NHL hockey teams are businesses, but then of course they're, they're also social institutions, the, and people go into one business versus another business, not always because the particular business is the most lucrative one that they could get into. In fact, quotations from NHL always strongly suggest that, uh, that running an NHL team is, is in, in no way the most profitable use of any of those people's time. But they enjoy it, and that's why they do it. The, uh, I mean, this, this job is not the most profitable use of my time. <laughs> that what I would never, I heaven knows I would never be anywhere else. That I'm going to assume that players' incentives are largely the same all the time, and players have an incentive to play as well as possible at all times. Almost all players in almost every situation don't have the luxury of not playing at their very best. The, um, their loyalties to a particular team, although they, they make a great big fuss about how loyal they are to their given teams, they know that that's not actually what makes them their money, and they know that they could be traded, and they know that they could be injured, and they might have to return from injury, and they know that any number of bad things might happen to them, and they'll be free agents at some point, and they're gonna to want to command money that they want to command in free agency, they're gonna to be able to have their pick of cities. They're, in general, and, and the last thing they want is, is to be known as somebody who didn't put 100% on the, on the ice every day. So we're assuming that the players, that, so the, the unspoken stuff, which I'm going to speak now, in the back of all this, is when you say that incentives are not aligned, that's a very generous way of saying, we don't like seeing it when teams lose on purpose. We being fans. So fans' incentives, what I'm also assuming, are essentially constant. That almost all fans want their team to win. Which is slightly controversial, but on the other hand, is also sort of the definition of the thing. <laughs> the, so, so some fans, I mean, I mean, there are lots of different kinds of fans, and we were talking about that in the panels, we've been talking about that repeatedly, that some fans, you know, there's, there's definitely a place in the world for fans who want to sit and watch beer and, and yell stuff at the TV, the, and, which is a great way to be a fan. You know, I personally endorse it very much. The, you know, some, some fans prefer to get into much more detail, they want to talk about how, you know, how are we going to be better down the road, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's a good idea for the team to lose for a little while because then in a few years they'll be better and then maybe they'll have a better chance of winning the Stanley Cup. You know, there's fans at various different levels of sophistication who enter, you know, who, who, who enter the equation at different levels, but at some fundamental level they still want to win. And it's managers and coaches who have the most complicated incentives, especially managers have the most complicated incentives, where, where the, also you want to win, but their time skills can be especially shortened and the draft order is a, is a great source of tension in this way. So, in particular, when I say the incentives of fans, players, and teams are not aligned, teams there meaning coaches and management, the, are not aligned in the sense that when you have weak teams, this draft order incentivizes teams to lose games. The, and, and, that, and those incentives are generally not aligned with the players who invariably want to win games and the fans who generally also want to win games. And especially uh, if you're an owner and you're in it for the money or the prestige, Neither gaining a lot of money nor having a lot of prestige are consonant with losing games at all, let alone deliberately. So what we've done recently is we changed lotteries, which doesn't actually change the incentive structure at all. It just means it just means we don't we don't actually change the method in which we give out the picks. The underlying structure of how the picks are doled out to the teams is still that the weaker teams get the better picks. We just sort of jostle around a little bit. The, and so it doesn't it doesn't actually change the underlying Expected values, it only changes the underlying uncertainties. It changes how sure you are about getting a good pick depending on how weak you are. But it doesn't actually, there's no inversions of any kind. It's never, it's never, you're never incentivized to win where previously you were incentivized to lose. The incentives are unchanged. Only the, the numerical magnitudes of the rewards are changed. So the, but none of the, none of the relative uh, change, there are no relative changes at all. So in fact, this is, this is sort of slightly strange, because people talk about the lotteries like it's a big deal, but in fact, from a, 
from an uh, sort of an economics point of view, it's kind of obvious that there's nothing there. So the thing I'm going to convince you is better that we should switch to is called gold drafting. Uh, and it's named after a man named Adam Gold who presented the idea seriously at a Sloan conference a handful of years ago. Um, you may have seen it repopularized by Shane Doan, who brought it up again. Various other people have brought it up at various times. It's an idea that's occurred to a number of people simultaneously. Um, although I, I attach it to Adam Gold because he took it seriously and presented it at, uh, uh, at, at Sloan however many years ago, and also because it's catchy. Good name is a good name. Um, and the idea is that the teams with the most points get the best draft picks. But not all of the points count as points. You only get points that count towards getting good draft picks if you're already eliminated. So the idea is after you're eliminated from the playoffs, then you begin accumulating gold points when you win. And then the gold points are just standing points. If you win, you get two points, and that's two gold points, and it just goes in the bank. And so the, the rough idea is the, that you're always incentivized to win. It's always in your best interests to win. If you're not eliminated, then winning may or may not put you in the playoffs. If you are eliminated, then winning gets you a better draft. So there's never, there's never any particular incentive to lose games. So that's the idea. The, so there are three primary objections which I am going to dismiss. And I'm going to dismiss them with data and graphs. The three primary objections are, one, that it will, that it will hurt parity. That because it has an element of rewarding, um, of rewarding strong teams, I, you have to win, you have to get gold points, in order, which this is my catchy name for points that you get after you're eliminated. We call them gold points. The, uh, and the team with the most gold points gets the best draft pick. Uh, you, uh, you have to, because it rewards strong teams, i.e. strong enough to win a lot of gold points, the, then people say, well, it'll hurt parity. The stronger teams will get the better draft picks. Uh, and as a corollary to that specific, people say, well, what if, what if you have a really terrible, what if you have a really terrible team by like some freak circumstance? The, um, that possibly they could get caught in a scenario where they could never ever um, accumulate enough gold points to ever get a half decent draft pick and they'll be stuck as a bad team, yeah, possibly forever, yeah, decades, maybe. You know, that, that's no fun for anybody. And the third thing people say is that, well, it won't, it won't really fix tanking, as we call it. It will just shift it earlier. People will, will sort of reduce their percentages from, from very low to actually zero earlier on by deliberately losing games. So, it turns out that the question of parity is not so obvious because after all, in addition to incentivizing winning, it also incentivizes losing at the same time. So it's not clear on the face of it if it rewards good teams or if it rewards weak teams. Because you have to be weak enough to be eliminated, but also strong enough to win games. So it sort of rewards both weak and strong teams at different times, which is part of the point. And so the question of parity is not so obvious, and so I made a bunch of simulations and I measured it, and it turns out parity is not effective at all. The second thing is, what happens if you have a really, really weak team? Uh, and so I did a bunch of simulations there, and it turns out that there's no difference between what happens to a really, really weak team under gold drafting and a really, really, really weak team again under any other kinds of drafting. So exceptionally poor teams, if they happen to want, work their way out of a hole the same speed. And the third thing that people say um, is that teams will just tank earlier, and so I've shown with some simulations that actually, if they understand the incentives they're being presented with, they won't lose any games, one or two games at most, if they actually know what's best. That this is always the point. So, first of all, I just have this purely historical, there's a lot going on here. This is a, a, a slope graph uh, showing how the systems, how plane drafting and plane drafting with lotteries vary between gold systems. This is just last year. So, the, here, on the left hand side, that's the number of, of standing points that these teams actually got. And, uh, and they're, they're, this is inverted, that's for Sam. The, the, and of course, Matthews, Toronto had 69 points in this year. They, and they won the lottery, and so they drafted first of all, and they took Austin Matthews. Uh, Edmonton here at 70 points per second, of course they, Winnipeg, won a lottery, and so even though they finished considerably stronger, in the, which is to say lower in the, in the playing draft standings, they jumped up here to number two, where they took Lina. Uh, and then you see Boston down here with limited to 93 points. They actually had a lot more points. So I just like this because it shows you that the teams aren't equally spaced, but of course they're equally spaced in the draft order by one. Uh, and I, so I listed all of the all of the picks here, um, and so here this this pick, for instance, was New Jersey's pick. Uh, they traded that pick to Ottawa, who took uh, who took Brown with it, and uh, and the pick that went back in return was was McLeod. But this is but this pick is I mean, Ottawa made that pick, but it was always New Jersey's pick. And then this is gold system points. This is the points I just I just measured. This is the number of points gold points that these teams got after they were eliminated. So Boston, of course, was eliminated on the last day. They got no points. After 
the, um, and so you see, you can see where the slopes cross over. You see where certain things would benefit and other things would not benefit from this pasture. So this is sort of pop, pop stuff. So for instance, uh, Buffalo took uh, took Neilander here in under gold system under gold drafting. They would have drafted second overall. So there's one team whose fortunes would have been dramatically changed. Of course, you know it's sort of purely for fun. Had we been had we implemented the system ahead of time, teams would have known about that and they would have made different choices. I mean, we're, the whole idea is that we're presenting people with different incentives, and so the, the choices that they make will change. Now, and I made uh, I made this graph for um, for all of the years going back to 2007, 2008, and so I can show you the other years if we like, but, uh, but we'll just carry on for now. You see that, that there's a handful of, of people who go up. Buffalo obviously goes up. Um, Ottawa jumps up by three spots. Colorado jumps down by four spots. But most of the people are, are more or less in line. So, so how did I, I, I said I did a bunch of simulations. How did I do it? So what I did is I took a 30 team, 30 team league. Uh, I used the bracket Terry model, which is, which is a fancy name for saying that I made up the strength for every team. It was just a number. Uh, and so my team has strength two and your team has strength one. And then the chance of my team beating your team is just proportional to the difference between our numbers. That's it. Um, and, uh, and because I wanted a probability, I took that difference and I stuffed it through the logistic function, which turns real numbers into numbers between zero and one, which is suitable for probability. So that's it. In fact, you saw the logistic function. Um, you saw it in, uh, um, uh, in an earlier talk. Uh, and so the, so that's, that's all that is. And so I'm doing simulations of, of 82 game seasons, 41 home games, 41 away games, where you just match up against these teams. You have these underlying strengths. And so if, if there's still a scope for randomness. You might win, you might lose. I set the initial team strength to, um, um, to a pattern of team strengths around zero that, when simulated without any changes to team strengths, gives you a distribution of points that's um, broadly similar to the distribution of points that we observe currently in the NHL. Um, so and I'm assuming a, a fixed fraction of games go to overtime and shootouts. Uh, and uh, so the, the point system in the NHL is, is what physicists call quasi-closed. On the one hand, you, you don't know how many points there are total for the, for the whole year, uh, because not every game is worth the same. Some games are worth two points, and other games are worth three points total. Uh, and so, there's, so, so strictly speaking, it's not a closed system. It's not like everybody fights over the same number of points. But it's also not an open system in the sense that there's not an unknown number of points because there's no, pre there's no external pressure on the number of extra points that get added. Like if you think to yourself that you have these two points and you have this extra bullshit winner point that gets added on, that you, there's, no, there's no systematic pressure that adds those winner points on that changes from time to time. Uh, and so the number of points you get in, so th there's something stochastic, there's something probabilistic there, but but it's not um, but it's not biased by any of the things that we're talking about. So that's so that so we can ignore that for these purposes. The, so then, when I wanted to simulate tanking, I I I made a, an assumption, and this is the key assumption. If you think there's something wrong, it's almost certainly going to be this. That I assume that tanking is deliberately, permanently, permanently lowering your team strength. That that you can make moves as a general manager. For instance, by trading away your players, by your better players, by by the most of the moves that you can make are ones that permanently change your team strength. And the and specifically, I decided for uh, to to make that assumption that teams would do so when they reached one percent, when their chance of making the playoffs in a given year reached one percent, they would choose to harm themselves in this way. And I decided, and so if, if it's going to make any sense at all, the harm that teams inflict on themselves in order to get a better draft pick had better be, has to be reasonably substantial if they expect to actually do worse than previously, but it also have, can't be too big or else, or else there wouldn't be any fig leaf of it being a good idea. So, so I decided to set the strength that they would do as equal to the value to their team of the third overall pick, which, which I picked as somehow totally arbitrary, which I picked as a hat. You know, that's the kind of, so if you just sort of imagine, that's the reward you get. You, know, you make your team worse or bad for however many games, and what you, you, your sort of expected return is a third overall pick. That you get. And, and so how did I get these values? I used Matt Cain's monetary model for the value of uh, first round draft picks, uh, which he spoke about in Vancouver. And, uh, and by coincidence, the curve where he estimates the, so he has a model where he models the expected monetary value of, of first round draft picks, um, that curve is extremely similar to the curve that Sean showed you in his talk, which was uh, came from a slightly different model. The, 
that Michael Schachter's made, um, but this same, but it has the same characteristics. That it falls off very steeply at first until the first 10 or 11 spots, and then it's very shallow. And then in particular, in later rounds, it's, it's so shallow that it's almost indistinguishable from flat. And so that's what I did in the simulations. I, I looked at 10 seasons at a time, so I could look at some long-term behavior, how things propagated through over time. The, so I start these initial team strengths. Then as the season progresses, some of the teams choose to tank as they get eliminated or not, depending on which simulation I was doing. The, so they permanently injure their team strength by a particular amount. Then at the end of the season, draft picks are awarded according to the scheme that I'm using. The, and those draft picks improve the strengths or, or decrease the strengths if they're relatively weak. Uh, according to that model, and then I add some stochastic levels uh, to account for the fact that teams um, that teams will change their rosters in various ways, and that those. And so here, here's another, you know, uh, dubious assumption is that those changes are uh, they were purely stochastic, the, and then so there were no changes in. Uh, so in particular, um, especially strong teams weren't reduced uh, systematically, like so it's not a regression; it's just just added noise. And the amount of noise is quite small compared to the original team strength. So what did I get? First thing I discovered is that parity is not strongly affected by changing people drafting. So plane drafting is with the plane black line, and the thing that I showed is the standard deviation of the point totals uh, at the end of each season. So I did a number of simulations. Uh, I forget how many, I think 100,000. Not a million, that's too much for my little baby computer. And, and so plane is just plane drafting, that's it, with no strange things, and so you see that, that the parity slowly decreases just a little bit and then it stabilizes. Uh, so it increases a little bit. So down, lower standard deviation means more parity. Uh, and, and just for a test, I did a thing where, where I did reverse drafting. So where the weakest draft, the weakest teams get the worst picks. And sure enough, parity, parity just goes away completely. The standard deviation of the team just skyrockets off to infinity. Pretty soon, pretty soon, you know, you have teams which are losing 81 games a year. <laughs> the, so if anybody tells you that that's a bad idea, that we should really, we should really reward success and let the and let the winners take the best draft picks without any modifications, that is a the plane with tanking, where I, where I insert, where I turned on that flag, where once teams hit 1%, they hurt their team in the hopes of getting better. The, some of them, of course, do get better, and then you see that the parity is less in that scenario. Mostly it tracks the same thing, that's the dotted line, and then in between them is what you do if instead of having tanking, you have this goal system. So in particular, it's slightly more parity than the current, the current what we have now, where teams will occasionally tank, and it's slightly less parity than if, than if we had some sort of perfect world where we had the old draft system but no tanking. But we just assumed that teams never responded in that way. So when it comes to parity, changing the goal drafting changes almost nothing. Second thing is what happens if you have a really weak team? How do they fare? A little run to the litter somehow. So I did this by simulating a bunch of team strengths at first. So we have a 45 point team, or a 46 point team, a 51 point, a 53, a 50. So this is a handful of really dreadful teams uh, at various things. And then I just tracked, using goal drafting, I just tracked how many points they got as as it wore on, as they, as they got better and better draft picks. And, and sure enough, it takes about five or six years before even extremely weak teams are starting to get up into the, up into the low 90s, high 80s, into the, maybe we're gonna contest for a playoffs territory. The, so that's, that's so, the, so in particular, I feel like, I mean, five or six years is a long time to wander in the wilderness if, you, if something terrible happens to your team and you become extremely bad. Uh, but in particular, it's, it's consonant with the kind of suffering that we've seen various fan bases go through um, over the course of the last 30 or 40 years. You know, the team being, being extremely weak, not really in serious contention for the playoffs for a span of, of five or six years, you know, there's no way that I'll tolerate anybody saying, oh, we can't do your system because it would have effects like that. We already have effects like that, and we tell fan bases that go through it that they just have to want it. And the third thing is, well, well, teams will just tank earlier. That's what people say. No, they'll just tank earlier so that they'll actually be eliminated, and then they'll they'll try and get better. So there's two reasons why this is why this is not so. The first is that if you believe that tanking, as I assume, is a permanent lowering of the quality of your team, then it's extremely short-sighted to hurt it when you will need it to be strong momentarily. The second thing is, even even despite that, if you say I'm going to do it anyway. The, it turns out you get almost no benefit. So this, this graph is by far the hardest to read, so I'm gonna walk you through it. The, the scale is logarithmic. It's average, this is the average probability of making the playoffs, and I say weak teams, I only looked at the five weakest teams in a given, in a given run through the season. 
So I'm assuming that the teams that are going to tank are the teams that, that happen to fall out of contention early. So this is five weakest teams, not the five weakest teams, not the teams with the, the lowest underlying strength, but the five teams with the smallest probabilities of making the playoffs in a given year. So, so the lines are gonna go down. They're by definition the five teams in the, in the direst straits. And, and this line here, 10 to the minus two, that's 1%. That's the, that's the line when I'm assuming once a team hits that, that's when they're gonna to artificially injure their team. The, and in fact, and this is a dirty methodological secret that I'm gonna tell you about, by far, the most difficult thing about this procedure, about the whole idea, by far, the biggest weakness is, it is not straightforward to know if a team is eliminated or not. In fact, in fact, it's a computationally difficult problem, intractably difficult problem, which takes many hours, even on extremely sophisticated computers, for a league as big as the NHL. Especially if you want to be sure about teams being eliminated or not, the moment they're eliminated. It's very, very difficult. So in fact, what I did to measure whether or not a team was eliminated is that I set myself an arbitrary threshold probability. And those probabilities are also estimated from the fact that I know how I'm doing the simulation. And so I set that as one part of a million. So that was the threshold probability that I used for eliminating. And in fact, you can already see that this, this discontinuity here is, uh, is an artifact induced by my, uh, my uh, lack of simulation. And as they talk with logarithmic scales, they always show the dirty side of your data down here. But, but the point is, that, so, that's, so this bottom of the graph, 10 to the minus six, that's effectively zero for the purposes that's, that's eliminated in this case. And so the teams that tank, so in systems when you have tanking, teams follow this dotted line, which is lower than the solid line at all times, as you'd expect. Those teams are, are lowering their chances by making themselves worse. And the, the solid line is what happens to weak teams when there's no tanking. And so the horizontal distance at any given time, that's how many extra games you get at a particular probability level when you have tanking versus when you don't. So the idea is that you're going to tank and you're going to get some extra games in which to bulk up on these gold points, how many games do you get to bulk up with? How much, how much extra feeding time do you acquire for yourself? Well, if the elimination threshold were 10 to the minus three, then you might get, you might get almost 10 games in here. But if it's, um, if it's zero, which is what I suggest, then it's so small it can barely be measured. So even assuming, I mean, obviously there's machine error of some sort here because I'm not resolving to that, to that precision, the, but you can already get an estimate based on the other shape of the graph that the number of games that you get, the amount of extra tanking possibility you get is at most a game or two. So even if, even if it were in team's best interest to tank under this new system, even for any length of time at all, which it's not, even if it was, there's actually no benefit, a very little benefit to be gained. So that's, that's the point, is that you have uh, th those are the three, those are the only objections I've heard to the scheme that make any sense that seem to me to be worth answering. I'm sure you'll come up with others in the question session. The, and so I decided to preemptively answer them. And, and so what are the benefits? So the benefits are, it aligns incentives between, between all these teams. The, and in particular, the, what you should now lose sight of is that the chief benefit of aligning these incentives is that every team plays 82 games of meaningful hockey every year, no matter what, every franchise. And which, which I don't think I need to tell you, but I will, means more money, more excitement. This is a money gaming proposition. It certainly would make the draft, end, make the trade deadline a lot less fun, because teams wouldn't be trading away their better players when they were weaker to get weaker. Uh, they would be keeping them in the hopes of accumulating gold points and getting better draft picks. But every player who's not traded, for instance, who's an impending free agent, that makes free agency more. So the swings and roundabouts and all of that. The, it improves parity slightly from what we've got now. In particular, it does not harm parity, and it does not unduly punish very weak teams. And so with that said, uh, I assume various of you with your NHL contacts will uh, will have this fixed by uh, next year. Thank you. <laughs>
this is very interesting work, and as someone who's new to the hospitality community, I actually wasn't aware of the whole faculty plan. It was very intriguing. Uh, I just had two more on the technical side question. When you say you permanently penalize people for tanking, that's like in a single season? That's right, within, within that one season. Okay, and then I wasn't sure if I caught this or not. Are you simulating off season tanking, like intentionally selling off your players no. in future assets, or no. you know, the curve of people getting better at the end? No, there, there's sort of levels to Micah, this too. get a microphone so people online can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the, the, que the question was, was I, was I looking at tanking in season only or, or also in the off season where teams might, might sort of anticipate a weak season and, and uh, you know, lean into it? Uh, and the answer is only in season uh, in, this, in this case. Uh, I think, the, I mean, we routinely call that other thing tanking also, but I think it's, uh, it's somehow it's a part of a different battle. And I think you would have to attack that problem in a different way. I don't think the, the simulation harness that I used here would work for that question. Okay, as well. Um, I was wondering if uh, you put much thought into uh, like a market, like a free agent based draft. You know what I'm saying? Like, where oh. you just, no, <laughs> uh, I, no, I don't know what you're saying. Oh, okay. So, like, instead of a draft, we just have like 200 r rookie free agents oh. uh, cap them out. What are your objections to that idea? Uh, my objection to that is, is, uh, not philosophical in nature. My objection is only that I that I think this plan would be incredibly fun, <laughs> but, and, I, and I say that as a fan, and I also say that as somebody as you know, I, I guess a media member if you like, with a, with a stats website. Is that I think that those that the, the draft pick race that it would be cut, you know, where teams tried to win, and you would have you know, and those like sad sack matchups where the team in 29th plays the team in 30th in March, all of a sudden is a big big deal, and now you know, and and, and so you give. Fan bases you know, who have been recently disappointed as their team fell out of the playoff race re-energizes those fan bases and gives them something to cheer about. And I think I think that's a prize worth chasing. So I don't mind I don't mind sort of in, in itself this idea of having free agent rookies. Uh, I just think that this is way more fun and that would kill. Um, so it seems to me like you, um, your construction is kind of missing um, one important source of variance, which is that it seems like you have a deterministic outcome for each draft pick because you're using maps models. You're not simulating around those points, right? So you don't have first picks that turn out to be crap some years. Um, it seems like a one year that's going to affect your variance. I mean, maybe it'll stabilize in the long term, but uh, my my rough guess is that and you're definitely right. I'm not. I'm, I'm assuming a fixed work for all those first rounders. Um, it, it's, I mean, yeah, it's definitely not, not the case. You know, sometimes you have good draft picks who are bust, and you also have lower round picks who are good, which are also not included in the model. I'm just assuming that lower round picks have no impact on, in, in aggregate. My, my guess is that it doesn't matter. I think it'll just make the variance a little bit larger in a handful of things that you measure, but, but the only way that you would model that is by assuming that some percentage of them just happen to be different from their listed value. And, and you're going to model that with a, I guess, with the normal distribution, probably, or maybe not. Maybe you do some sort of sophisticated distribution, in which case maybe it doesn't even matter. No, I'm not sure. And I guess I think it doesn't matter about having them for sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's a great idea. But one question I have is, uh, Mike Babcock admitted that he didn't play the team um, in a way that was geared towards winning games. And so I guess the, the, the difference between tanking in the way that Mike Babcock did versus the way that uh, uh, you know, you're referring to tanking is permanent versus impermanent damage to, to team performance. Um, how do you think impermanent, um, that you're using uh, uh, non-optimal uh, roster combinations would affect uh, the goal of the model? Uh, I think, so I, uh, I didn't mention it explicitly, but I obviously did not include those sorts of things, you know, things that coaches do have discretion over. We're just going to play, you know, weaker, which is to say, younger players more. You know, we we're going to plan for how they're going to be good in a few years, not for how they're going to win today or tomorrow. And, you know, those I, I ignored those changes in part because I personally don't see that kind of tanking, if you call it tanking, as a serious problem that requires combating. The the deliberate 
you know, we're going to assemble a bad team, a team that cannot be deployed to win systematically. You know, that I consider the problem that would seriously, that would seriously annoy fans. Um, I, I also think that, that it would go away, in a way, even this impermanent sort of tanking, if you call it that, it would go away if it was incentivized away, which I think this does. And so in fact, the, the knock-on effect that might be bad there is that it might actually make the development of young players harder. So right now, young players can develop, um, you know, within reason, can develop better on weak teams, where there isn't an immediate incentive to win, where they can get more ice time, where they're making mistakes in the NHL setting is not, you know, doesn't have terrible consequences. Whereas if you had cold drafting, you know, because every game matters, you know, it would become more, more ratcheted up. And maybe you might get a, a circumstance like the opposite of what they have in the NFL, where, where you might have even more pressure against young players. Um, that could be unfortunate. You would need. Pardon, pardon me? Maybe you have to increase RFA like you said at the same time. Yeah, you might. I mean, anytime you make a serious change like this, that you should expect something to come out of the woodwork somewhere you didn't expect it, and there's going to be CPA pressures with literally every change. But then there are also CPA pressures associated with not changing. So you would have to be careful about it. Uh, one question for each guy, actually. It's for Sean, um, if I were to draft an over eight here, uh, would that start the clock or change that at all? Because hypothetically, the amount of time that I get is rice, kind of like a Jimmy Beasy situation. And then uh, for Micah, um, you mentioned like the 29 versus 30 game at the end of March. The, as far as I, and I could be wrong, but I, as far as I understood, the margins were very, very low, or small, I should say. Uh, so hypothetically, if 30 is eliminated and 29 is not, you have a situation where 29 wants to lose and 30 wants to win. I'm sorry, the second question was super interesting. Could you repeat? <laughs> um, the, 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 how long do you get? I'm assuming it's the same, but I, I don't know. If hypothetically I draft an overager, do I get the same amount of time with his rights as I would a first year player? No. How does that change? Well, it depends, I suppose, right? Do you mean like if you draft a guy who is two years past? Yes. Um, right, so that, it depends, okay. is the short answer, I guess. But for the Leafs, for example, um, i trying to think of which one it was specifically, but the argument against one of the players they drafted was that the next day he was going to be available to be signed, so what was the rationale to locking that player up? And I guess the uh, short answer is depends. Sorry. So, <laughs> the, the, I, I, don't, I don't think such scenarios in practice could actually arise. Um, there, there, is a, there is sort of a, a, like a murky area where, you know, in between when you're thinking to yourself, oh, we're totally going to make the playoffs this year, and when you're actually eliminated in that sort of dreary times when you're like, this is bad, is it really bad? Kind of is sort of really bad. <laughs> but then you, you, know, you, you go through those moments as a fan, and I'm sure you do also as a team. And so teams that are stuck in that, you know, are, have slightly unclear incentives. Where they, they're sort of caught between the between, they don't know if they ought to be, you know, getting down to getting to get eliminated, to start accumulating gold points. But but I think that I think that plot I showed showed that, that that fuzzy area is quite small. And so the chance of being caught in a game like that is reasonably small. I think if you're a little bit earlier than that, then the weaker team is saying the team that's not eliminated is saying, you know, we could totally still make it, of course we want to win this game. Or and of course if they're after it then then they both want to win and get gold points. So you might you might have teams. You definitely will have teams who are trying playing one another who are both want to win but for different reasons. You know, this, these ones want to make the playoffs. These ones want to get a good draft pick. And that might be a little bit weird. Um, I don't know quite what that experience is going to be like as a fan. But I think the total number of games where you get that sort of ah, this is you know this is strange and weird to like where Buffalo fans are cheering for goals against. You know, like which is a thing that happened recently. You know, I don't I don't think you're going to get any any scenarios quite like that. I think, I, I think there's a quantitative improvement there where, where you, you accept a handful, like three or four games a year, which are like that in exchange for maybe, you know, maybe a hundred games that, uh, that are like that the other way. But I'm some sort of skip all on that. Okay, uh, so that is it for
presentations. Um, again, thank you for everyone for coming right now. A couple quick things. One, just if you are an RIT student and you found this interesting and want to have any interest in working with the team this year, talk to me or Ryan at some point. Um, two, thanks again to the School of Mathematical Sciences, the College of Science, and Paul Lewis uh, Arena for helping sponsor this event. Um, thanks for everyone who donated and helped out. Thanks to Ryan for all the help in organizing speakers and Paul Winger for organizing the video. Um, and everyone else who I forgot. Uh, Paul Lewis Arena is actually helping to sponsor the event by letting it borrow some jerseys because yes. we have a hockey game to go play. Yes. So. Yep. so we have ice time at, Paul, at Ritter Arena um, from 5 to 7. So people should uh, head over there now. Um, it is, we'll have to figure out. Sure can get there, yeah. So if you if you go out, um, yeah. So we're right here. So we are right here. Okay. So we're we're right here right now. If you go out this door, um, the entrance here, and turn right. And head that way, you'll be going down this. How do we get to that parking lot up there? Wait, from this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you can yeah, park, you can park, park you can park there. Yeah, you can park that way. So Unlike, you can drive around as long as there's no event going there's on. A, there's a campus is a big circle. Okay. So if you park this S lot down here, yep. you just want to drive around and then after you get to the circle, so you should see your uh, a lot right here. Do you know the name of the what, what that uh, I don't know if you zoom in, it might yeah, it might take. Yeah, so that's, if you want to drive and you, park there, you should be able to park there. You would be able to see the stadium yeah. or the bleachers yeah, for the, the right. Right. Uh, what? Yeah. Parking lot D. Parking lot D. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there are, we have two, we have two locker rooms for, for men and women. Um, there should be people over there now who can direct. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if you want to sample the way out of the garage, you can. Um, afterwards, people will probably be going to some of the great rooms and having a Sorry, I didn't know you were there. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much.